Hebrew Readers Church. I'm your brother Kasafo. No, your brother Zakwa. Hope you all enjoying this Shabbat day. We thank you all for joining us, spending the time with us, and also we appreciate you all taking the time to check out the content, check out the website, and share any information that has been helpful to you or that you may think will be helpful to someone else. All right. All is well with you, Zakwa. All is well. All right. Praise Allah. Let's jump in here. In the last discussion, we touched on how a man has to learn the commands himself first, that he may teach his wife the faith so that she may guide the household in the instructions of Allah so that the name of Allah is not blasphemed. Allah and Christ are both about accountability. So if the head of the house prospers, then the whole house will prosper in due time as we've seen in Hermas and Jacob's case, because it started with the man doing right for things to turn around. For example, Jacob's wives eventually overcame their contention with one another to humble themselves and be on one accord with him before leaving Mesopotamia, and his twelve sons eventually overcame the sins of their youth by going through their growing processes, having their father praying and having compassion for them as he did for Reuben, and his instructions being on their minds to help them in their trials, like it did for Joseph. And the remembrance of honoring him, bringing them to repentance in their respective growing processes, like it happened for Judah, who considered how not honoring his father to get his counsel was a part of the reason he fell. We also learned in past times how Hermas, working on his own growth, not bearing a grudge with his family, nor being careless, but taking courage to strengthen his family by no longer neglecting them and speaking words of righteousness daily, not letting his wife have her own way and not ceasing to reprove his children, holding them accountable so that the family eventually came to repentance. Here today... Let's get into discussing the family relationship some more to get some insight on some things and understanding the important roles each person plays, especially the men. Let's start with understanding and perspective for men. Men, as heads of the house, what your family does affects you and what you do affects the whole family by evidence of even when Hermas was doing right, his family's shortcomings had an effect on him. Can you read Hermas, parable 7, chapter 1, verse 3, please? I say to him, Sir, if they perpetrated such deeds that the glorious angel is embittered, what have I done? They cannot be afflicted otherwise, saith he, unless thou the head of the whole house be afflicted. So being the head of the house... Though a man grows and gets to the place of doing right before Allah Hayyam, just as Hermas, nonetheless, what his family does has an effect on him because he is the head of the house. So, some afflictions may come because of the deeds of our family and some from our own growing pains in our growth process. Yet, Allah Hayyam doesn't give a man more than he can bear. Can you read First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, please? There have no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But Allah is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Knowing he is faithful, we have to endure with temperance, staying out of our emotions, so that we can actually see and be engaged in his spirit so that we'll be able to see that way out. All right. Can you read Sirach 2 and 1, please? My son, 
If thou come to serve the Lord, prepare thyself for temptation. That's what it is. James 1 and 2, please. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. So set our hearts right to be joyful, understanding it's all to try our faith in Allah Hayyam, and for our growing to become patient, unmovable in our trust in Allah Hayyam. Continue, please. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. For patience to have a perfect work, we have to grow in temperance, being understanding and long suffering, so that angry temper doesn't spoil our works by being hasty in times of trouble or emotional, so we can have perfect patience by not giving into vexation, pride, sorrow, wrath, or anger when we are tried. Sirach 2 and 2, please. Set thy heart aright and constantly endure and make not haste in time of trouble. There's the necessity not to be hasty as that spirit works with hatred and the devil to get us. Continue, please. Cleave unto him and depart not away that thou mayest be increased at thy last end. Elohim dwells in long suffering without anger and he is love, and his love is in his law. So cleaving to his law and love, being long-suffering, speaking truth with one another, keeping from wrath to be emotional, and hating lying will help us have his angel of peace with us in any matter. Continue, please. Whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully, and be patient without our change to a low state. We have to be in the right spirit regardless of what's going on because if we get vexed in our emotions while going through the trial, we're going to fall to anger or hurt someone else in the process not seeing all things coming from Allah and for our growth. Continue, please. For gold is tried in the fire and acceptable men in the furnace of adversity. Believe in him and he will help thee. Order thy way aright and trust in him. So understand that we men have to also bear our family's burdens and patience with cheer without giving in to bitterness, along with our own burdens through our Lord Christ Yache. We hope that helps for understanding the opportunity and journey before us, that it's all to build us in patience and faith towards Allah Hayyam, even when we get to the place when we're actually walking in the faith by not falling in the commandments and having no works in the flesh, but in the fruits of the spirit. Now for a man, we have to be focused and diligent because what we do has an effect on the family too. Hermas parable seven, one and three, please the rest of that part. But if thou be afflicted, they also of necessity will be afflicted. But if thou be prosperous, they can suffer no affliction. So if a man does well, his family will eventually be prospered as well in the end of the matter. Ecclesiastes 7 and 8, please. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Keep in mind the end goal of what we are working towards is our salvation and our family's salvation. We have to have that faith as evidence that we believe the deliverance will come, though it may not look like it in our own current situations or our family's situation. Hebrews 11 and 1, please. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. The faithful will keep the thing hoped for in mind, being patient to see it come to fruition, even as our forefathers did. Can you read the rest of Ecclesiastes 7 and 8, please? <clears throat> and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Amen. The patient man will endure the trial for him and his family, but the proud will get in his feelings when things don't go his way or the way he thinks it should go. 
and will not stand the trial, being that he wants his own way, lifting himself up against Allah Hayyam, because he cannot submit himself to Allah Hayyam's way and process. That's something we want to be mindful of, understanding what spirit is provoking us to get frustrated in our trial and in our family's growing process. Now, let's look at the trial of our repentance and its benefits. Now, there will come a time when the man and or family comes to repentance, seeing their faults and having no pleasure in them any longer, putting forth the effort to truly change. Now understand, when we come to repentance, whether it be the man or the whole family, it doesn't mean afflictions are going to just go away. Because when we repent, our repentance has to be tried as well as the Lord wants to be sure we are truly repentant and not trying to deceive him. Can you read Hermes Parable 7, chapter 1, verse 4, please? But behold, sir, say I, they have repented with their whole heart. I am quite aware myself, saith he, that they have repented with their whole heart. Well, thinkest thou that the sins of those who repent are forgiven forthwith? Certainly not. But the person who repents must torture his own soul and must be thoroughly humble in his every action and be afflicted with all the diverse kinds of affliction. And if he endure the afflictions which come upon him, assuredly he who created all things and endowed them with power will be moved with compassion and will bestow some remedy. That's the accountability Allah holds us to. First, we have to repent wholeheartedly. And that repentance has to be tried before we are forgiven by us holding ourselves accountable to do right, being humble in every action to abstain from evil. Then, when Allah sees we're not just saying we repent, but actually bringing forth the fruits of repentance, he will be moved to compassion to give us some remedy from our afflictions for the former sins we committed and the trial of our repentance. Continue verse 5, please. And this will Allah do. If in any way he perceived the heart of the penitent pure from every evil thing. Humbly keeping ourselves from all evil and not having the desire in our mind nor working the works of evil, confirming ourselves to walk and think according to Allah standard is the seal to show a pure heart in his sight. Those who cleave to Allah Hayyam's law will overcome their struggles, keeping themselves from all feelings that take them away from the law and the fruits of the Spirit, and will be counted worthy of repentance to receive His Holy Spirit. Can you read Hermas, Parable 8, Chapter 6, Verse 1, please? Um, let me jump in real quick. Oh, okay. Um... Allah Hayyam holds us to a, a true accountability um, as far as repenting. Repenting involves two things. Repenting involves confessing your fault and putting forth the works to change or putting forth the power to change what you're doing that's wrong to doing what's right. So in a full repentance, that's what Allah Hayyam is looking for. He's making sure that we're able to confess our fault in humility and then put forth the effort of the work to actually start making the necessary changes in our life. And that's when Allah knows that we truly repented by the works or the deeds that we do after the repenting process has started. So, so everybody can understand that. Thank um, you. Hermes, you're welcome, brother. Hermes Parable 8. Chapter 6, verse 1. After the shepherd had examined the rods of all, he saith to me, I told thee that this tree clingeth to life. Seest thou, saith he, how many repented and were saved? I see, sir, say I. It is, saith he, that thou mayest see the abundant compassion of the Lord. How great and glorious it is 
and he hath given his spirit to those that are worthy of repentance. We see through the scriptures, we actually have to cleave to the law to bring forth the fruits of repentance, keeping from all evil to receive the spirit. Elohim is really looking to see who will truly repent and walk the straight path of his commandments as he gives repentance to those who he sees will actually do right and aren't just repenting in hypocrisy, i.e. doing the wrong, knowing what you're doing is wrong, confessing it to Allah Hayim, then continuing to do the deed, being in a cycle of repenting. That's not where we want to be. Can you read verse 2, please? Yes. Uh, if you want more information on what Brother Kasafu is speaking about right there, you can go to the Catching a Lie lesson. It goes into detail into that. Um, Thanks. You're welcome. Wherefore then, sir, say I, did they not all repent? To those whose heart he saw about to become pure and to serve him with all the heart, to them he gave repentance. But those whose craftiness and wickedness he saw, who intend to repent in hypocrisy, to them he gave not repentance, least happily they should again profane his name. Hmm. Let's understand what he means by craftiness. Lightly forswearing ourselves, cleaving to our own understanding of a verse to give credence to our desire, applying scriptures to others, but omitting ourselves to be accountable to keep them. Those are examples of the craftiness that Allah can see. And notice he pays attention to our heart. So it's not about what we say. He's watching what's in us and what we're doing. So repentance is a confession with the mouth, yet, it is. It also has to be in our hearts, which is shown by our abstinence from the evil and eventually all evil to receive the spirit. Allah is an Allah of knowledge and he weighs actions and the spirits that accompany us. Can you read 1 Samuel 2 and 3, please? Talk no more exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For Ahaya is an Alahayim of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Proverbs 16 and 2. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but a higher way of the spirits. So it's important to understand what Alahayim is looking at to know. It's not about our words, but what we're actually doing. And he's watching what spirits we're walking in. So it's not wise to judge ourselves according to our own perception, but to assess ourselves according to the law so that we can see if we're in good standing according to him since he's weighing the spirits that's around us and within us. So all that in summary is for us to be assured and understanding that repentance in word alone will not get us forgiveness right away. But we actually have to show our repentance through our actions to keep from every evil thing, being humble in every action, showing our heart pure, and that will move Allah to compassion to bestow a remedy for our afflictions and give us his Holy Spirit. This is why we don't judge where folks are, as everyone has their own afflictions to go through for different reasons, and Lord willing, they will not only get to wholehearted repentance, but also purify their hearts in keeping from every evil by the end of their process to receive the Spirit, while we focus on our own plowing to grow and purify ourselves unto Allah in hopes that we receive His Holy Spirit. Knowing the process, let's have the perspective of the angels who also know the good end to come if we go through afflictions. Hermas Parable 7 Chapter 1, verse 5, please. But it is expedient for thee and for thy house that thou shouldest be afflicted now. For us all, let's keep in mind it's good for us to be afflicted, to learn our lessons, for us to be humble in every action as the Holy Spirit is tormenting us with her discipline to obey Allah's voice for our profit in the end of it all. 
The law truly shows us our desires that are against Allah. That's why we can easily change some things and other things are very hard and difficult, which pinpoints our true heart's desire, and that includes the fruits of the Spirit. Continue, please. But why speak I many words to thee? Thou must be afflicted as the angel of the Lord commanded, even he that delivered thee unto me. Also, let's take everything that comes to us cheerfully and count it all joy to fall into temptations because is Yache, our Lord, who ordains us to be afflicted or to go through hard situations because he is a father who rebukes his children who he loves so that they may come to repentance and be saved and to grow in areas which has need of strengthening or which needs strengthening. Continue, please. And for this, give thanks to the Lord, and that he deemed thee worthy that I should reveal unto thee beforehand the affliction, that for knowing it, thou might endure it with fortitude. Amen. Fortitude means strength of mind that enables a person to encounter danger or bear pain or adversity with courage. Hopefully that helps understand we have to go through trials and growing experiences with cheer and fortitude to show ourselves truly repentant by the purity of our hearts to keep from every evil. Also, we have to be selfless, focusing on growing and overcoming ourselves, because when we sin, it affects us and the members of our family. So we have others to be considerate of when reasoning in our minds to endure our afflictions with fortitude, to grow through the experiences. Being selfish in mind and heart to make decisions only based on yourself would tear down the household. Can you read Philippians 2 verse 4 and 5, please? Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Yahweh. Hopefully that helps for a family's perspective to focus on keeping themselves from evil, looking not only on their own things, also plowing a way to overcome their struggles, and also doing this work in themselves with their family in mind, looking on what's best for them too, knowing their deliverance depends on the prosperity of the husband in righteousness, even as Christ was also mindful to fulfill all righteousness to save his bride and children in the world of all nations. Good, Zach? Well? Yep, we're good. All right. Now, let's get understanding of true repentance in Allah Hayim's sight to build on where, we, where we're going here. It's important to understand for everyone, men and women, for us to get our hearts circumcised in Christ, we actually have to repent with the whole heart and work to change to do right and actually start doing right. And then he will help us so that we won't depart from him. It's not just going to magically happen without us being accountable because the experiences we are going through are necessary for us to learn our ways aren't right and for us to get tired of walking in them and come to repentance with our whole heart. Allah, I am understood and foretold of these things, and we're going to look into it. Zakwa, if you will. Zakwa, sorry. <laughs> Zakwa, if you will. No matter, man. <laughs> <laughs> if you will, read Jubilees chapter 1, verse 9, please. But they will forget all my commandments even all that I command them. And they will walk after the Gentiles and after their uncleanness and after their shame and will serve their Elohim. And these will prove unto them an offense and a tribulation and an affliction and a snare. So we would be walking after the unbelievers, serving the deities of the world, not the true deity, Ahaya Elohim, and Christ. By evidence of us forgetting the commandments and not obeying Ahaya's voice, which will have us in the tribulations and afflictions amongst the Israelites around the world. Continue, please. 
and many will perish, and they will be taken captive, and will fall into the hands of the enemy, because they have forsaken my ordinances and my commandments, and the festivals of my covenant and my Sabbaths. So, not keeping the commandments and covenant to obey his voice led to the genocides and atrocities of slavery that befell us in world history among the aboriginals, indigenous of the Pacific and Caribbean, the natives of the Americas, and the Bantu, who became known as the Negroes. This is the same cause of the afflictions we are facing today. This lets you know any religious path or group or any doctrine under a name or names that do not lead us to remember the commands and obey Allah's voice and observing his feasts and Sabbath is not the true religion of the deity. Ahaya Allah. Continue, please. And my holy place, which I have hollowed for myself in their midst, and my tabernacle, and my sanctuary, which I have hollowed for myself in the midst of the land, that I should set my name upon it, and that it should dwell there. You will find animal sacrifices common in the ancestral history of the Bantu, Native Americans, indigenous tribes of the Caribbean and Pacific, along with the aboriginals of the Pacific as well because these are the children of Israel. And in the laws, we were commanded only to sacrifice unto Allah at the temple, and the sacrifices had to be done by his priests, the sons of Aaron. Yet, as we can see, the scriptures foretold, we would forsake Allah and his holy place and his commandments, ordering us not to sacrifice anywhere else besides the temple. So you can find the children of Israel around the world in their respective histories, and some still to this day, sacrifice and animals contrary to what the law commanded to be done, forsaken Allah holy place. Continue, please. And they will make to themselves high places and groves and graven images, and they will worship each his own graven image, so as to go astray. So now see here. You see, the children of Israel also created their own graven images. And that means they also went beyond the religions of the unbelievers in the world to establish their own deities to sacrifice unto in high places and worship. So that's why there are so many new deities among the natives of the Americas, aboriginals and indigenous of the Pacific and Caribbean and the Bantu of sub-Saharan Africa in their respective histories and cultures. Many of them have a pantheon of deities they worship in their cultures respectively, and they usually have to do with nature since they follow the Gentiles who have a thing for worshiping creation instead of the creator. Continue, please. They will sacrifice their children to demons. So child sacrifice can be found amongst us in our histories like Central America. But that's not the only type of child sacrifice that was done. Pay attention, as this type of sacrifice is important to grasp in what we're about to read. Continue, please. And to all the works of the era of their hearts. As we are discussing family and parenting and such, this is important to understand that it is a sacrifice of children to do the works of errors of our hearts to raise them according to our own perspective instead of Allah Hayyams and His law and testimonies so that they will walk in the same errors of our hearts being given to the same idols that lead us to think our own perspective of right was actually the right way to go instead of submitting to the ways of Allah Hayyam. In a brief summary of what we read here in these prophecies Allah Hayyam gave in Jubilees, the prophecies show parents walked in the customs of the unbelievers and also after their own customs that was from worshiping the deities they created for themselves and taught it to their children, giving them over to the idols that led them astray to their own perspective of what's right instead of submitting to what's right to Allah Hayyam and his law and testimonies to the fruits of the spirit. That mistake has trickled down through history to where we're seeing the effect of the former idolatries of our foreparents and the lifestyles they were living 
is affecting us today by the errors we still walk in when we assess and see our upbringing wasn't according to the righteousness and the love described in the law of Allah Hayim. Understanding what befell us helps understand why we have to confess the sins of our fathers too. When we get understanding that it wasn't the right way we were taught to walk in so that we don't walk in their shortcomings ourselves and our own shortcomings as well. Allah Hayyam knew what condition we would be in in this present day as a result of our history. Let's see what Allah Hayyam said would befall us because of what we were doing and what we came up in. Can you read verse 14, please? And they will forget all my law and all my commandments and all my judgments and will go astray as to the new moons and Sabbaths and festivals and jubilees and ordinances. Here we are today as he prophesied. In religions and ideologies and personal perspectives that don't require us to keep the laws, judgments, and leads us to go astray in the ordinances, feasts, and jubilees. Yet, for all the mistakes made and forsaken of Allah Hayyam and His law to do what pleases us, there will come a time when the kids will wake up to the right way. So it wasn't for nothing. Continue verse 15, please. And after this, they will turn to me from amongst the Gentiles, with all their heart and with all their soul and with all their strength. And I shall gather them from amongst all the Gentiles, and they will seek me, so that I shall be found of them when they seek me with all their heart and with all their soul. We see, thankfully, the remnant will be turned back to seek Allah and Christ Yache with all their heart and soul. We see we would have to go astray and be afflicted to come to repentance in the end. So that's to understand we have to go through experiences to grow out of our sins. It doesn't just magically go away overnight, but it takes experiences and getting afflicted and having a change of heart to want to come out, then putting in the effort intentionally implementing the change to come out of the struggle for change to happen. Now let's understand why and Zachariah is jumping, of course, you know, as needed. Now, let's understand why Allah doesn't just do a miracle to keep us from sinning. Because Moses asked him not to suffer us to sin at all when he heard the troubles we would go through because of our sins. And this is good to look at in the midst of talking about parenting, because as parents, we may think to protect our kids from everything so they don't go through any trials. But let's see if that is actually profitable to do in the sight of Allah Hayyam. Can you read verse 19, please? And Moses fell on his face and prayed and said, O Ahayyam Allah Hayyam, do not forsake thy people and thy inheritance, so that they should wander in the errors of their hearts, and do not deliver them into the hands of their enemies, the Gentiles, Least they should rule over them and cause them to sin against thee. Let thy mercy, O Ahayyam, be lifted up upon thy people, and create in them an upright spirit. And let not the spirit of Belia rule over them to accuse them before thee, and to ensnare them from all the paths of righteousness, so that they may perish from before thy face. Keep that note to know. What the spirit of the devil does is to ensnare us in the path of righteousness so that we may die because life is in the path of righteousness described in the law. Continue, please. But they are thy people and thy inheritance, which thou hast delivered with thy great power from the hands of the Egyptians, creating them a clean heart and a holy spirit. And let them not be ensnared in their sins from henceforth until eternity. Now, in a nutshell, he's saying, don't let us do any wrong or make any mistakes in our life and give us your spirit so nothing happens to us so that we may be saved. Hold that thought. 
we will get Alahayim's thought on that outlook. But firstly, let's understand good parenting skills from Alahayim. Can you read verse 22, please? And Ahiah said to Moses, I know their contrariness and their thoughts and their stiff-neckedness. And they will not be obedient till they confess their own sin and the sin of their fathers. You all remember the law to be understanding and long-suffering to get the mastery over all evil? See, even as a parent, Eliam took the time to understand us, not judging or condemning us, but knowing who we are and operating in that understanding so that they can be long-suffering and help us by letting us go through what we need to go to to grow from where we are. That was just a key parenting understanding. Okay? Now let's read again to understand what Alahim's viewpoint is in regards to the perspective of protecting our kids from themselves and not letting them do any wrong or being accountable for doing anything wrong by not holding them accountable or responsible for their actions. Can you read verse 22 again, please? And the highest said unto Moses, I know their contrariness and their thoughts and their stiff-neckedness, and they will not be obedient till they confess their own sin and the sin of their fathers. So letting us go through our experiences is essential without protecting us from our own heart's desires, since we have to overcome contrariness to Allah and our pride because we won't be obedient until we see our faults for ourselves and our parents' errors that they corrupted us in and confess them both. So to put this in plain speech, we have to go off and do what we think is right in our own perspective or the perspective we learn from our parents, though it's truly walking according to the laws of the devil because his spirit ensnares on the paths of righteousness. And in the wrong perspective, we go through our afflictions and get to the point where we see it for ourselves that it is not the right way, that we're seeing things and living just like the prodigal son in Luke 15 and return in repentance to Allah seeking to be his servant in humility with our whole heart. When we get to that place of a true whole heart of repentance, wanting to obey him in everything, let's see what will come from that so we can know the signs of whole heart of repentance or the characteristics of it, if you will, to truly know when we experience a true repentance. Continue verse 23, please. And after this, they would turn to me in all their rightness and with all their heart and with all their soul. We will start implementing the laws in our life and perspective to come to Allah in all uprightness with all the heart and soul. That's the phase when we actually desire discipline and the Holy Spirit will torment us with her discipline to obey Allah voice and her laws of the fruits of the Spirit to ensure we can be trusted. And after this, when Allah sees that we came with all the heart and soul in uprightness, Let's see what he will do. Please, bro. And I shall circumcise the foreskin of their heart and the foreskin of the heart of their seed. He will give us the circumcision of the spirit in our heart to be true Jews and to be true brethren and children of Abraham by faith amongst the Gentiles. By the faith that we have shown and we will see the change in our children as well because he will give them the spiritual circumcision too, because of our obedience. So you can see how important it is to get it right and how it actually affects the family. Continue, please. And I shall create in them a Holy Spirit. He will send his Holy Spirit to dwell in us because we have shown we can be trusted through humility and obedience to his voice and obedience to his son, Lord Yache, and the fruits of his Holy Spirit. Continue, please. And I shall cleanse them so that they shall not turn away from me from that day until eternity. Then once the Holy Spirit makes these repentant folks a new creature, they will never turn back from Allah to sin again, keeping his Holy Spirit pure and undefiled by doing his will in everything like the Holy Spirit desires them to. Continue, please. 
um, let me add something real quick. Sure. When it said, um, and I shall circumcise the foreskin of their heart and the foreskin of the heart of their seed, it's because the parent would no longer be a hypocrite. The parent will actually be walking in the spirit, walking, walking in the commandments, walking in the fruits of the spirit. And the child would not get to see a hypocrite of a parent. The child will actually get to see that the parent is actually true to their word and doing what they're saying that they're doing. Because what happens is that the children, we may say something with our mouths, but the children are weighing our actions. So we may tell the child not to do something, but we may actually be doing it. And the child sees that hypocrisy and starts doing what it is that we're doing. Though we may get upset or vexed about it when we see the child doing it because we can't see it in ourselves because we have too much pleasure in it. So it's actually once Allah cleanses us and cleanses the parents, it's easy to cleanse the children because you're walking in it. You're, you're operating in the law. You're operating in the fruits of the spirit. You're operating in the wisdom of Allah so there's no more hypocrisy. So the child gets to see a true example and see you actually walking and dealing and responding, not being hasty, being slow to speak, being quick to do that, which is good. When the child sees those attributes, they pick up those attributes. So you can see how it can save the whole household. Amen. Thank you. And their souls will cleave to me and to all my commandments, and they will fulfill my commandments. Now, this is interesting. <laughs> you can see that they actually have the Holy Spirit because that's the Holy Spirit at work in a man because she cleaves to her husband, having her desire unto him and submit herself to his role to fulfill all his commands. So you'll see her works in a man doing likewise. Continue, please. And I shall be their father, and they will be my children. They see the true children of Allah Hayyam, are known by the works of his wife in them, just as Christ, the twelve virgins, and the seven maiden women who help the church show the works of wisdom in themselves that she may be justified. Continue, please. And they will all be called the children of the living Allah. And every angel and every spirit will know, yea, they will know that these are my children, and that I am their father in uprightness and righteousness, and that I love them. You see, the end of this whole matter was shown that he actually loves us by taking the time to understand us and find out what we need to come out of our struggles. And seeing our struggles, being long-suffering, letting us go through what we need so that we may be saved in the end. One may think as a parent to let our child go through things is forsaking them and not love because we are protecting them from their own hurdles they need to overcome. Or that loving them is being there to save them from themselves in every instance you can. But our Allah Hayyam and Everlasting Father Yache actually shows us that in his perspective of love that he learned from the Father, he lets us go, make mistakes, and he actually didn't forsake us. But he truly was with us, praying for us to the Father, though he had to let us go through what we needed to, as we ought to be there with our children, as they have to go through what they need to, to believe on our Allah Hayyam. We ourselves likewise ought to be praying for them and there to guide. Lord Yache wanted us to understand, of course, when our hearts are ready to receive it, he wanted us to actually understand that he actually never forsook us, though we went away from him to understand that he truly loves us and his ways are equal and right instead of our own ways, so that we would believe and know he loves us to return and not turn away from him again. You can't protect your child from everything. 
some things you have to help your child navigate through so they can learn how to deal with circumstances themselves and learn how to implement the law in situations. Good. Amen. Okay. Amen. Jubilees 1, verse 5 and 6, please. And he said, Incline thy heart to every word which I shall speak to thee on this mount, and write them in a book in order that their generations may see how I have not forsaken them for all the evil which they have wrought in transgressing the covenant which I established between me and thee for their generations this day on Mount Sinai. So when his children do evil, he doesn't forsake them in his heart. Yet when needed, he separates from them to let them go through what they needed to because he's not an enabler or supporter of evil, but keeps us accountable to do right if we are going to be with him. Continue, please. And thus it will come to pass when all these things come upon them that they will recognize that I am more righteous than they in all their judgments and in all their actions, and they will recognize that I have been truly with them. So holding us accountable out of love, when we come to repentance, we see he was truly righteous not to enable or support our bad behaviors. Just like the prodigal son who realized it was better to go serve his father than live in pleasures of the world. Even so, when we come to repentance, Truly, we realize a relationship with accountability with Allah Hayyam is better and more righteous than our concepts of a relationship where we have freedom and support to fulfill our pleasures and not be accountable in our self-pleasing. Hold on, right. Kassim. Okay. Can I add something real quick? Sure. All right. Um, Pastor just said, realize the relationship with accountability with Allah is better and more righteous than our concept of a relationship where we have freedom and support to fulfill our desires and not be accountable in our self-pleasing. Uh, in, the, in the Testament of Gad, chapter 3, um, it says, And now, my children, hearken to the words of truth toward righteousness and all the law of the Most High. And go not astray through the spirit of hatred. Now, this is interesting because it's actually going to fulfill and show us what hatred actually does so that we can understand that Allah actually loves us by operating the way that he does with us. It says, for it is evil in all the doings of men. Whatsoever a man doeth, the hater abominates him. And though a man worketh the law of the Lord, he praises him not. So if you're doing good according to Allah, hatred doesn't praise you. Right? So if you were doing wrong, hatred would praise you. Though a man feareth the Lord and taketh pleasure in that which is righteous, he loveth him not. He dispraiseth the truth, so that means he, he will lie. He envieth him that prospereth. Right? So if Allah would hated us, if we were doing good, he would be upset with us. That sounds like the devil. He welcometh evil speaking. So that means that he would actually, it would actually be him showing that he hated us if we were doing evil speaking and he welcomed it. He loveth arrogance. So if we operate in an arrogance, it would actually show that he hated us if he allowed us to continue to do it and continue to operate in it. For hatred blindeth his soul, as I also then looked on Joseph. So you can see that Allah actually loves us by holding us accountable and making sure that we are doing better and not just allowing us to stay in our own pleasures and our own self-pleasing for the things that we have pleasure in. So it shows that Elohim loves us and he doesn't hate us. Yeah. That's essential for understanding. Thank you. Praise Elohim for guiding you on that so we can know what love is and what love is not. 
All right, I'm continuing. If Alahaya would have supported or enabled us in our wrong perspectives, it would have hurt us as we would have become willful to our detriment. And now with what Zakwa had shared, you can understand the dichotomy, hopefully, of the devil's antics or, or the devil's concept of love in the world. And what it's doing to us, as opposed to Alahayim's concept of love, which is to save us. Continue in Sirach 39, please. Conquer thy child, and he shall make thee afraid. Play with him, and he will bring thee to heaviness. Continue, please. Laugh not with him, lest thou hast sorrow with him. At least thou gnash thy teeth in the end. When you see a child doing something that is unacceptable or something that's not pleasing unto Alahayim, don't don't smile at them or give them the insinuation that they have done something well. That's what he's talking about. Laugh not with him, at least thou hast sorrow with him. Because if you laugh at the things that he's doing wrong, he's going to think that he's doing right. And this is why the wisdom scriptures bring more insight to the actual law so that we can actually understand how to implement the law in real, in real life terms, in real life scenarios. Because when that child does wrong, you make sure that you have that stern face so that they can understand that, hey, I'm serious. This isn't a laughing matter. Let's make sure that you understand that this is not the right way to go so that I can correct it, and then we can go forward the right way. Thank you. Give him no liberty in his youth, and wink not at his follies. Elohim doesn't give us liberty to sin. And he doesn't pass over our follies in the sense of overlooking them and not using it as a teaching moment. Can you read Sirach 15 and 20, please? He hath commanded no man to do wickedly, neither hath he given any man license to sin. You have also in the Shepherd of Hermas, you can see the interactions of the angel of repentance with Hermas. He was he didn't play around with Hermas when Hermas was going the wrong direction. He was sincere. And as Zachwa said, being stern is not to be mean, but to show it's not a laughing matter, it's not a joke. And Yache also commended the angel's righteousness in the end of the book. If you had the opportunity to read it, or when you do take the opportunity to read it, you'll see Yache spake on his gravity and his soberness, how serious he was about helping so that we can understand how to take things serious and make sure we're attentive to help our children. All right. Knowing that Allah doesn't give us license to do it. All right. We don't have a pass to do the wrong thing. He actually gives us some afflictions to help humble us when we commit folly, to keep us from waxing stubborn in our sins, to be disobedient, can you read Hebrews 12 and 6, please? For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So no, the correction and afflictions we go through is out of love, so we shouldn't get wary of being corrected. Many times we get consumed in the small picture of things, in our feelings, not understanding the larger picture of Allah Hayim, knowing what our experiences are, I'm sorry, knowing that he knows what experiences we need and knows our weak areas to help us grow. Continue in Proverbs 3 and 11, please. My son, despise not the chastening of Ahia, neither be weary of his correction. For whom Ahia loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. He is giving us what we need while we have hope in our youth in the faith so that he may humble us 
while we are as children, before we get stubborn and stuck in our ways, being reprobate, forsaken Allah Hayyim. This is out of the wisdom that he teaches as well in Surat 30 and 12, please. Bow down his neck while he is young. Allah Hayyim is a spirit, and he sees our spirits. Knowing though we may be adults in fleshly age, we are spiritually children, being unlearned in the words of righteousness and walking in them. So he's humbling us while we are young in spirit. Continue, please. And beat him on the sides while he is a child, lest he wax stubborn, and be disobedient unto thee, and so bring sorrow to thine heart. He beats us on the sides with afflictions and punishments in this life while we are young in spirit, so he won't have to sorrow over us in the end because of our disobedience. So those afflictions we have to go through to come to repentance is from Allah Hayyam, our Father, to keep us from waxing stubborn, because if he just leaves us to ourselves without correcting us with afflictions, we will stay in our iniquities and become willful. Can you read Sirach 30 and 8, please? And horse not broken becometh headstrong, and the child left to himself will be willful. He doesn't want us to become stubborn, headstrong, or willful in our sins. So out of love, he doesn't forsake us by correcting us and holding us accountable to do right, chastising us with afflictions so that we can be humble to see our way isn't right and that he is more righteous than us because he truly never forsook us but loved us to hold us accountable so that we could come to true repentance in the end and he could have joy of his true children. So we see the process the Lord lets his children go through as a righteous parent in his nurture with patience and long suffering as they go through the struggles they need in their life in order to see for themselves that his way is the right way after repenting from going their own way and then they return unto him with their whole heart, with a desire for discipline, to be obedient to him in every respect. And they'll show their desire for obedience by implementing the laws, being tormented by the mother with her discipline, to make them obedient to his voice and her laws and her fruits. After the children show all uprightness, following after the law and fruits of the Spirit, with all their heart and soul, he will circumcise their heart, and give them a new spirit, sending the Holy Spirit into their soul to make them new, and he'll cleanse all their sins by their faith in the blood of his Son and their fruits of repentance and good works, and they'll never sin again, being his children in truth and righteousness. The purpose of going through this is to understand true righteous parenting from Allah's highest perspective and that it's no miracle to come of us just being righteous without going through the process of overcoming our sins. And Allah won't just keep us from doing anything wrong because he loves us and knows we have to come to repentance for ourselves in order to turn unto him and not turn back. So the truth is that because he loves us for real, we actually have to go through the changing process Put the work in and show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word and implementing the commandments so that we may be perfect in all good works and be accepted of him as his children and he our father. So men and women, as we are all designed to be the true children, we all have to endure this process for salvation. Okay? That's a good correlation because think about how it is in the world um when when somebody gives us something we don't really truly cherish it and it's just it's just the way things are but if we had to sacrifice and we had to work for something and we had to save and we had to to truly grind it out and to build to get to a certain place or to get something we hold it more dear to us and we protect it and we safeguard it and we keep it and we keep it up to par and we we keep it safe and we make sure it's it's well and 
Elohim understands us. He created us. We're not going to really appreciate something unless we have to sacrifice something for it. And in this case, we have to sacrifice our own desires. And that's the only way that we're going to truly appreciate what it is that Elohim has given unto us. Because if he just gives it to us, we're going to cast it. We're going to render it underfoot. We're going to take it for granted. And we're going to lose it. Not taking care of it. It's just like giving something to a child. You give something to a child, they didn't have to do anything for it. They're going to beat it up. They're going to abuse it. They're going to cast it away. It's the right. same concept. Yes, yeah, so. I'm with you, Casa. Thank you. We got some good understanding, some good foundation of things for men, families to focus on and understand for perspective and understanding Allah Hayyam. Now let's get into building the family since we know how Allah Hayyam works. And if you hadn't watched the lesson prior to this one, honoring and understanding our heavenly parents in the law class, honor your parents. Please go back and check it out. As And the, the deliverance for the families in Christ is essential to building for all of this. Building the family. I'm touching on that. Let's look into it. Sirach 36 and 24, please. He that getteth the wife beginneth a possession, a help like unto himself, and a pillar of rest. A man's possession starts with getting a wife, just for him from Allah Hayim, and she builds up his house with their children. That's the goal. First Corinthians 3 and 11, please. For another foundation can no man lay than this is laid, which is Yahweh Christ. Yache has to be the foundation of the family that the husband and wife is building. There has to be one standard, and that's Elohim's standard. The wife can't have her own standard, and the husband can't have his own standard. They have to both humble themselves to what's right before Elohim. Then there will be peace. First Corinthians 3 and 9, please. But well, we are laborers together with Elohim. We parents have to see ourselves as laborers with Allah Hayim to build his building up. As Zachwa spoke of before, that we are raising our kids to serve Allah Hayim rather than ourselves. We're not to make too much of our children, blinding our eyes to their faults for our own glory to feel good about ourselves, but instead correcting our children in the time of their youth so that they can be built up strong to serve Allah Hayim. We can't blind ourselves from their faults or justify their doings because they're our children. Continue, please. You're Allah Hayim's husbandry. You're Allah Hayim's building. We are his building and his children that he gave into our care to nurture are his building too. Continue in verse 10, please. According to the grace of Allah Hayyam, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. So men and brethren, as wise builders, let's lay the foundation of Christ for our family, walking in the commandments and faith with pure hearts, with others in mind. Then, when that foundation is laid, our wives will build our children on the foundation of Christ. Continue, please. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. So men have to be mindful what spirit is at work in us to build as it will affect how we are building. If we're building in anger, the whole house will be in strife. If we're building in pride, the whole house will be blind. But if we build in humility, the whole house will be able to see. 
So it's very important that the parents are examining themselves to be good examples for their household. Psalms 127 and 1, please. Except the higher build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the higher keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. So when we get a wife, be sure to put Allah in first to build the house and keep it, lest the adversary find an entry through his devices. Okay. Now we're going to get into looking at how and what spirits are at work when the adversary finds his way into the house. The spirits that destroy the family. Sirach 36 and 25, please. Where no hedge is, there the possession is spoiled. This is true, that if the Lord isn't in hedge for the household, the possession is spoiled by the wrong spirits getting an advantage to cause contention and transgression in a family. Let's look at the demons that get advantages to break up the households. In Testament of Solomon 22, please. And he answered me thus. I am called Asmodeus among mortals, and my business is to plot against the newly wedded, so that they may not know one another. So it's this demon that hinders newlyweds from taking the time to get to know one another, which is essential to having a lasting relationship. In that lesson, man, his wife, and Christ, you may recall, and if you haven't seen it, please check it out. Zakwa talked about being one, where a man can see himself and his wife as they know one another and she operates as he does because they've built that trust with one another. Yet this demon here plots on couples to keep them from taking the time to get to that place with one another. Continue, please. Or prohibits them from being honest with one another. Hmm, yeah takes honesty to get to know one another. And I severed them utterly by many calamities. Then he causes hardships to befall them, and they don't come together when times get tough, not having taken the time to build up a solid relationship with one another, nor putting the work in through faith to walk in the fruits of the Spirit with one another or possibly not being honest with one another. So he accomplishes his goal of severing them utterly by the calamities he causes. So they didn't really get that bond from the beginning, so he can separate them very easily through the strifes and the calamities that come. On the other hand, Allah gives us time to get to know one another in the law to keep us from this demon's agenda when newly married. So you can see how Allah understands everything truly. <laughs> His law is set to protect us from all the things that are out there. Deuteronomy 24 and 5, please. When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war. Neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife which he hath taken. It was sad in a wife that her husband can't spend time with her and has to go out on a journey to war or for business. So he has to stay home and cheer her up by getting the quality time with her for them to form their bond. Knowing the necessity for couples to know one another, Allah commanded in the law that when a man takes a new wife, though he has to work that he may eat, he may not be charged with any business that requires him to go abroad from his home for one year, nor can you send him off to war from his home during that time, so he can spend the first year nurturing that relationship, cheering up his wife, who wants to spend time with him while still going to work locally to provide for his family. As we know, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat, and... He that doesn't provide for his own house would be worse than an infidel. So just to be sure we understand the laws and saying he doesn't do any work. It's just you can't send him on a journey to work to get him away from his family. First Timothy 5 and 8, please. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, you have denied the faith and it's worse than an infidel. 
Hope that helps for understanding this demon. Let's see what else this demon Asmodeus does. Continue Testament Solomon 22, please. And I waste away the beauty of virgin women and the strength their hearts. Let's get an understanding of this here. Exactly. I'll explain this stuff. Um, estranged means cause someone to be no longer on friendly terms with someone. Of a person no longer close or affectionate to someone. Alienated. Of a wife or husband no longer living with their spouse. Zachor explained to me he wastes away their beauty by turning their hearts to hate men. Thus their beauty is never given to a man, and they just grow old being alone, with their beauty eventually fading through their hearts, being estranged from men. Let's see the mindset this demon gives to virgin women to leave their beauty to be wasted. In Joseph and Asinus chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 4 and 5, please. Okay. Uh, the book of Joseph and Asenath, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, Asenath despised all men and regarded them with contempt. Yet no man had ever seen her. For Pentapheris had a tower in his house, and it was large and very high. The word despise means feel contempt or deep repugnance for. The word repugnance means intense disgust. And contempt is the feeling that a person or a thing is worthless or beneath consideration. Is there anything you'd like to shed on this, Zachwa, before we continue? I think the definitions are pretty clear. Um, yeah. Everything's pretty clear. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very straightforward. Let's continue to see. And you can, if you don't see it already, you can see her parents cockered her and pampered her. And we're going to see the lifestyle she was living. All right. Can you read in verse four, please? And the ceiling of that room was of gold, and within it were ranged the innumerable Alahims of the Egyptians in gold and silver. And Athenith worshipped all these, and she feared them and offered sacrifices to them. In estranging her heart to hate men, she even treated her father with hatred when things didn't go her way. Can you read chapter 4, verse 5 through 12, and then verse 15 and 16, please? Um, let me hop in here real quick. Sure. Um, you can see um, right here from the Testament of Solomon 22 how Osmodeus actually wastes away the beauty of virgin women and strains their hearts. You can see how, though Osmodeus does that work, we're going to see the other works of all the Alahayim that she was serving. So you see, it says, Asenath worshipped all these, all the Alahayim to the Egyptians, and she feared them and offered sacrifices to them. So let's see how she operates based off of the Alahayim that she's serving and those that have place in her. So we can actually see when we're, if we're operating in such a fashion as Asenath, what's actually guiding and leading you. Gotcha. And Pentapheris said to his daughter Astinus, My child. And she said, Lo, here I am, my lord. So it's interesting. She's coming off very meek on the outside. You would think, oh, okay, she has this great reverence for her father. Lo, here I am, my lord. Right? But we're going to actually see what's going on within. Right, because you can clean the outside of the cup, but when she's faced with adversity or something that she doesn't like, 
Let's see if she's still holding on to that same meekness and that same gentleness and that same reverence. And he said to her, sit down, please, between us. I want to talk to you. And Athenith sat down between her father and her mother. Before this, they had brought her gifts. So she was peaceable as they did what pleases her and given her admiration. But as Zachwell said, let's see how she acts when they do contrary to her desires. And the father, Pentapherus, took her right hand in his right hand and said to her, My child. And Athenith said, What is it, father? Pay heed here that he is speaking gently to her. He even took her hand in his hand, right? As a father. Okay, continue, please. And Pentapherus said to her, See Joseph, the mighty man of Elohim, is coming to us today, and he is ruler of all the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh has appointed him ruler of all our land, and he is the distributor of corn throughout the country, and is to save it from the famine that is to come upon it. And Joseph is a man that worships, worships Elohim. He is discriminating and a virgin as you are today and a man of great wisdom and knowledge. And the spirit of Elohim is upon him, and the grace of the Lord is with him. So come, my child, and I will give you to him as his wife. You shall be his bride, and he shall be your bridegroom forever. Notice her father gently explained to her how good a man Joseph was, and told of his desire to give her to him, as a father has authority to do so. Let's see her reaction. And when Athenith heard what her father said, a great red sweat came over her, and she was furious and looked sideways at her father. There you see, she's overtaken with the wrong spirits, and pride and anger is shown in her countenance towards her father. Then, what she is about to speak in her feelings is not good, as the idols now will cause her to sin further. And she said, Why should my lord and my father speak like this and talk as if he would hand me over like a prisoner to a man of another race, a man who was a fugitive and who was sold as a slave? Despising her father's suggestion for her best interest as if he's trying to control her like a slave, this is where the demon would estrange their hearts and be rebellious, not seeking to be under the authority of any man. You see, she also wouldn't even consider what her father was saying to hear the whole matter, since she already had her own thoughts about who Joseph was in her mind, projecting the man's character. We will see here that she already decided for herself who she will marry and desiring to walk in her own counsel. Continue, please. No, I will marry the eldest son of the king, for he is the king of all the earth. We can see the lack of respect and reverence for a man, even her father, that the demon places within its victims. She set her mind to do something that Allah didn't ordain, but in her own self-will, that was the plan for her. She desired to marry into royalty, seeking to up her status and have the glory of being married to the king, as some women marry for the stature it brings, rather than in uprightness. This is where the demon causes virgin's women to deal proudly, to make decisions on their own about who they will marry, and usually with self-interest in their intent for marrying the man they choose. But they will do all this without consulting their father on the matter, to be sure it's well in his sight, because of the estranging of their hearts toward men. Uh, if you will. On hearing this, Pentapherus thought it wiser to say no more to his daughter about Joseph, for she had answered him arrogantly and in anger. So there we see how the demon estranges a virgin's heart to be arrogant and angry and hatred towards men, and going about being high-minded. 
whether about who they will marry or not marry, or any other matter. In the end, they end up not married at all, and they grow old being single, having their beauty wasted away by this demon. Did you want to touch on anything before continuing? I did. Okay. Um, You noticed that she was sitting between her father and her mother. Yes. But all her hostility went towards her father. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the father and the mother were in agreement. They came. They both sat on both sides of her. They were in agreement on their plans for the daughter. But she aimed all her hostility toward the father because that's how that spirit works. Hatred it for men. Right. Hatred for whoever's in authority. Because they don't want to be controlled. They want to control. So you can't be you can't be humble and subject to another when that spirit is making you want to be the dominant. Good understanding. With all that, deliverance is possible. We have it in the testimonies. This demon tried to... Oh, thanks. This demon tried to waste away the beauty of the virgin Sarah in the scriptures as well, ruining every relationship she tried to have so that he could keep her alone and waste away her beauty as she aged. Can you read Tobit chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, please? It came to pass the same day that in Ecbatain, a city of Midia, Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, was also reproached by her father's maids, because that she had been married to seven husbands whom Osmodeus, the evil spirit, had killed before they had lain with her. Hopefully this helps sisters understand. You may have had a lot of relationships go bad, because you got in those relationships without Allah Hayyam's blessing it, since you didn't go about things in the right manner according to the scripture from your youth. Yet understand, those relationships went bad because it wasn't the man Allah Hayyam ordained for you. So, have faith and work to overcome those spirits that have led you away from Allah Hayyam, and gain a reverence for men, and work on the humility of the faith, to be ready to suit yourself to the man Allah Hayyam ordained for you, if it be according to his will you be married. Even Sarah here, when the man Allah Hayyam ordained for her to marry was ready, she was given in marriage to know there is deliverance from this demon. We encourage you to read the story of Tobit and Joseph and Asenath, when we get that book on the website, to see both Sarah and Asenath were delivered from the demon and idols to be given in marriage to the man Allah Hayyam ordained for them to be given to. Okay. Touching back on this demon Asmodeus. This demon works on estranging women's hearts before they are even married. So parents have to stand in the gap by prayer, doing right themselves for this demon can enter into the hearts of all women and having righteous discourse daily with their daughters and examining themselves to be strengthened in the faith to bring forth obedience to Allah from their hearts, lest that possession be spoiled by this demon getting an advantage over them. Older women have to examine themselves that this disdain for men be not in their hearts. We as a body have to raise our daughters to have that humility in themselves and a love for a man with reverence and shamefacedness, starting with us so she can keep the faith and have the law and fruits guiding her perspective. Can you read Sirach 7 and 23, please? Ask thou children, instruct them, and bow down their neck from their youth. 
Both children, as virgins, ought to be taught to focus on caring for the things that belong to the Lord. Being guided by the wisdom and instruction of Allah Hayim, and nothing else. 1 Corinthians 7 and 32 and 34, please. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is married care for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. For a son, his focus from his youth is how he may please the Lord, keeping his law and walking in the fruits of his spirit. Right? Verse 34. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. For a daughter, her care is to be for the things of the Lord, cleaving to his law and the fruits of the spirit, so that she may be holy in body and spirit, preserving her virginity and keeping herself from unclean spirits. Her father is there the helper in these things. Sirach 7 and 24, please. As thou daughters, have a care of their body, and show not thyself cheerful toward them. Remember we talked about earlier about taking things serious when you see children not doing something right. We got to be attentive to teach our children why they are young, so they can learn humility from a youth, being focused on pleasing Allah Hayim, and be careful for our daughters, not putting them in environments where their body can be polluted or defiled, and helping them understand how to protect themselves according to the law as well. And while raising her, pay attention to what she's doing, and if she does something that isn't right, don't show ourselves cheerful like it's okay, neglecting to say anything, or laughing it off like it's cute. But use the opportunity to teach her in the gentleness and meekness of Christ, not taking the matter lightly to neglect the teaching opportunity, but be courageous and help her understand the correct behavior according to the law, so she can have the reverence and respect for Allah Hayim, knowing He holds her accountable, and she will appreciate you in the end for holding her accountable out of love, and know that you truly love her to guide her to do the right thing so it may be well with her. Your role as a parent teaching your daughter the right ways of Allah Hayim is very important because women have power and an effect on society. If you hadn't watched the Girl Power Lesson or the Women's Series, please reference those for understanding. But for now, let's look at the effects of parenting on a daughter. In Leviticus 19 and 29, please. Do not prostitute thy daughter to cause her to be a whore, lest the lamb fall to whoredom, and the lamb become full of wickedness. All right, let's dig into this here. Prostitute is H2490. Again, the definitions we need here. A primitive root, properly to bore, that is by implication to wound, to dissolve, figuratively, to profane, to profane a person, place, or thing, to break one's word, defile, break, pollute, cast as profane, profane self, prostitute, slay, slain, sorrow, stain, wound. The word whore is age 2181. It's a primitive root. It means to be highly fed, therefore wanton. The definition of wanton is interesting. It means to, to lack restraint. To commit adultery. I'm going back to the word for whore. To commit adultery. Figuratively, to commit idolatry. The Jewish people being regarded as the spouse of Ahaya. So you can see how this is not just physical whoredom. This is also in spirit into idols, cause to commit fornication, be an harlot, play the harlot. Notice that too. It's two different things. To be a harlot is to actually be in fornication, committing the act. To play the harlot, one can carry oneself like a harlot. 
and act in that manner, though the person may not fulfill the actual act of fornication with someone. Also, cause to be whore or play the whore. The two kinds, again, where a person can literally be doing it or act like one that does it. Commit whoredom, fall to whoredom, cause to go whoring, whorish. I think we get the drift here. And what the definitions are showing. Remember the definition for whore is also spiritual fornication against Allah Hayyam. So if we live a lifestyle contrary to Allah Hayyam, it's another spirit that is not good that's leading us into that lifestyle. So it's considered idolatry or spiritual fornication. So as a parent, remember, sacrificing our children to devils is also teaching them to live according to the errors of our hearts that are contrary to Allah Haim's ways, which would make our children idolaters like us, since we are pouring into them the doctrines of devils that we unknowingly live by, thinking it may just be our perspective of right and wrong and how we were raised. Understanding that, we saw the meaning of prostitute is also profane or defile or pollute. So when raising our daughters contrary to the Allahayim's admonitions, we pollute or defile them with the same idols of our hearts, and it causes them to fall into spiritual fornication, and they will eventually play the whore or harlot by acting or carrying themselves like one. Or they may literally become an harlot or whore being given over to the acts of fornication. You may even find when they're given into that spiritual fornication, their hearts can be estranged because that's heartening to idol. If a person cockers their child or pampers them, the concept today where we raise our daughters is the like daddy's princess where she can do whatever she wants. She can do no wrong. She's not accountable for anything. This type of stuff leads astray from Allah Hayyam. In either case, it will cause the land to fall to whoredoms, whether by folks being led by women or in desire to please women, they'll fall into spiritual fornication themselves. Or if they are also given over to the acts of fornication, they will be committing fornication with women by intercourse from women in prostitution or committing adultery with men's wives, whether literally or with the lust of their eyes, because the way the man's wife carries herself or dresses is in a manner of an harlot, so she would be enticing other men to look at her or desire her lustfully. All in all, parents, it's important to raise our daughters up according to the law and righteousness, like Susanna's parents in the Apocrypha did, so that she may carry herself virtuously with shamefacedness and modesty to help have a good influence on the land to cause righteousness to flourish. Since when folks see a woman's chaste manner of living, they are converted without the word to believe the gospel. Anything there, Zachary? No, I'm good. Okay. In regards to giving a daughter in marriage, Daughters, understand your father in the Lord has the authority in the faith. And there are steps Allah Haim has a man go through to know if the man is right for you. And Allah Haim will also have him talk to you as well about it and confirm the matter for you too. We have testimonies in scripture of how these matters work out the right way when done according to the scriptures. For the time being, one can visit the website tab, Building the Family, and the marriage tabs that are listed in the drop down tab under it until we get to discussing these things at a later time, if Allah Hayyam wills. All right. Staying on topic here for helping our daughters. After a man teaches himself, teaching his wife is important as his daughter needs that example to follow for her to go in the right way too. Can you read Polycarp? to the Philippians 4 and 6, this portion, please. Then your wives to walk likewise according to the faith that is given to them, in charity and purity, loving their own husbands with all sincerity, 
and all others alike with all temperance. Convincing your wife to good works through your good works and discoursing of righteousness daily will help set the example and teach your young daughter these good things. Can you read Titus 2 verse 3 to 5, please? The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of Elohim be not blasphemed. Get it acclimated with the women's series and the women's tabs on the website is a great tool for helping a man know what to teach his wife and daughter, and a great tool for women and daughters to learn the influences they hold, the attacks against them, and the remedies to overcome them through obeying Elohim's voice and reverencing their man. Hopefully that helps with some perspective on the attack on our daughters from their youth and some remedies we need to implement in the faith to help them. Let's continue learning about the spiritual attacks on the family. This demon Edmodius doesn't only work at turning away women. Let's see what else this demon's business is. Can you read Testament of Solomon chapter 23, please? And I said to him, Is this thy only business? And he answered me, I transport men into fits of madness and desire when they have wives of their own so that they leave them and go off by night and day to others that belong to other men with the result that they commit sin and fall into murderous deeds. All right, let's look into what this demon does. The definition of transport is overwhelm someone with a strong emotion, especially joy. Madness is extremely foolish behavior. And desire is a strong feeling of wanting to have something or wishing for something to happen. That demon also leads husbands into fits of sin against his wife, either a fit of madness to deal foolishly instead of in the knowledge according to the law, or a fit of desire to commit adultery against her with another man's wife or looking upon other women to lust after them committing adultery in his heart. A husband and wife have to work hard at keeping unity in the faith in this spiritual warfare. It's important to be diligent because not only is there an attack on newlyweds, but there are other spirits that seek to attack them during the course of their marriage as well. And before we continue, hopefully y'all noticed by the definitions, when we were reading the definitions for the the dis what of that the estrangement of the heart for the women how that demon leads a woman to have a a contempt for men what was that word again that it said that Zachary you remember was it a disdain um, from let me see a uh, despise despise strange right the word despise that was it thank you it said to feel contempt or deep repugnance for I'm just noticing how this demon he works to get us in our feelings even for the man he works to transport them into fits to overwhelm someone with a strong emotion so it's interesting how the things we're learning about about staying out of our emotions and being single minded looking for the will of Allah Hayim, you know casting all our cares unto him and not being anxious for anything but making our supplications known unto him these remedies or these protocols according to the faith is to help us keep from these evil spirits and how they play in feelings uh, that's true um i mean for osmodius the way that he attacks the men I mean, there can be circumstances that could cause a man to go into his emotions, whether it be bitterness toward his wife or maltreatment 
and that emotion or that um um uh, what's the word um stuff for the r um resentment there it goes he can have resentment and that resentment can actually transport him with a strong emotion for him to operate in madness so this is why we we definitely have to be mindful of our emotions and we also have to not we also have to be long suffering that's where the fruits of the spirit actually come to protect us we actually have to be long suffering and patient and have self control to not give spirits like this place to actually transport us where we're grounded upon yache and we actually it actually helps the husbands to be stronger in the faith and to deal with the wife, although he may have gained that resentment or that bitterness toward her, to actually work through that bitterness and actually to allow it to uh, let it go and cast his burden unto Elohim and pray about it and not take it personally to get in his emotions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The weapons are warfare, not carnal. Spiritual weapons. Let's get in to see that more of the spiritual warfare we face in marriage and in life altogether. Ephesians 6 and 12, please. Well, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. All right. Let's look at the spirits at work in this world to see their influence on relationships, to know when they're at work in amongst us. Fornication and jealousy are more important to understand as jealousy dwells in all the lusts of fornication. Who is she? Fornication is the mother of all evils. Excuse me. Can you read Simeon 5 and 3 and Reuben 7 and 4, please? Testament of Simeon chapter 5, verse 3. Beware, therefore, of fornication, for fornication is the mother of all evils, separating from Elohim and bringing near to Belier. Okay. Testament of Reuben chapter 7, verse 4. For in fornication there is neither understanding nor holiness, and all jealousy dwelleth in the lust thereof. Hopefully at a later time, if Elohim wills, and hopefully we'll get to discussing the spirit of fornication. And we've touched on it in prior lessons a bit, but understand it's more than just literally what we know casually of fornication today, you know, intercourse with someone. But in that spirit of fornication, this mother of all evils, she separates from Elohim and brings us near to Belier because there's neither understanding nor holiness in her. Okay, and all jealousy dwells in her lust. Okay, so we know it's more than just the act. Okay, Gad 7 and 7, please. Put away, therefore, jealousy from your souls and love one another with uprightness of heart. That's essential to at least stay away from the lust of fornication in one way she can seek to cause us to stumble, okay? This is needed to love in uprightness of heart to avoid jealousy since it's lust that is in fornication to bring us unto belly air. The husband also has to be mindful of jealousy to maintain sobriety, moderation, and avoid strife so that the spirit of jealousy does not draw him away from his wife by strife. Let's learn about the spirit of jealousy and strife. Testament of Solomon 34, 36, and 38, please. Testament of Solomon, chapter 34. And there came seven spirits, females, bound and woven together, fair in appearance and comely. And I, Solomon, seeing them, questioned them and said, who are ye? But they, with one accord, said with one voice, We are the 36 elements of the cosmic ruler of the darkness. The second said, I am strife. The fourth, I am jealousy. So these women are of the 36 elements of the cosmic ruler of the darkness. When we read in um, 
Ephesians 6 and 12 about the rulers of darkness of this world. These women are of those rulers. So jealousy and strife are feminine spirits from amongst the spirit of darkness. And ones we have to be aware of as these spirits lead us to the lust of fornication. Let's see what they do to a relationship. Can you continue 36 and 38, please? Likewise, also the second said, I am strife, strife of strifes. Mm -hmm. Likewise, also the fourth said, I cause men to forget their sobriety and moderation. That's jealousy. She's that fourth. That's what she seeks to do, to cause men to forget their sobriety and moderation. And what does that lead them into? Fornication. Her first attack is on the man to get him out of the temperance of spirit and soundness of mind in the faith into spiritual fornication, listening to idols, forgetting the law and fruits of Allah. I am. Continue, please. I part them and split them into parties for strife follows me hand in hand. And with the help of strife, another feminine spirit, she gets men into different denominations and camps outside of the one doctrine and spirit of Christ. Let's see what jealousy and strife does in the household. Continue, please. I rend the husband from the sharer of his bed, and children from parents and brothers from sisters. This spirit of jealousy and strife with it causes strife in parent-child relationships among siblings, and among spouses. So you can see how Ahaya really has to keep the house on the foundations of Christ for it to stand through the law and fruits of it, since different spirits just desire to cause dysfunction and separation. Remember, strife is stirred up by hatred, which brings forth wrath, anger, and pride in the heart. So we have to watch out for those spirits too. Proverbs 28, 25, please. He that is of a proud heart stirs up strife. See, it starts from pride in the heart and then gets us in our feelings to bring forth contention, seeing we're already conflicted in the heart. Proverbs 29 and 22. An angry man stirs up strife and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. Continue, please. Proverbs 15 and 18. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. So you see, pride in the heart stirs it up, and then that man, he would be angry or wrathful. In either case, he'll also stir up strife. But if we grow in the faith to be humble, patient, and slow to react, not being hasty of spirit, Allah will deliver us to find a way to subdue strife by showing our trust in him to stand aloof from it and having no pleasure in it, not giving credence to anger or wrath to stay in our feelings, and eventually those spirits not having place in us at all to operate. Read the rest of Proverbs 28 and 25, please. But he that putteth his trust in the higher shall be made fat. Showing our trust by the fruits of the Spirit to appease the strife will fatten us with more fruits in due time. A man of faith actually glories in being merciful and not giving into anger through his discretion. Can you read Proverbs 19 and 11, please? The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. That makes a man honorable to do so and not strive about being done wrong. Proverbs 23, please. Maybe you don't mind me. Um, the discretion of a man defers his anger. Um, when, you, when you actually understand something, it's easier to deal with it. It's because you don't understand something that we usually get angry because we don't know what to do. 
that's why the discretion of a man defers his anger because he understands what he needs to do in situations. And it is his glory to pass over a transgression. So when something's done to him and he understands why it was done, it's easier to pass over it and not take it personally. Praise the higher for you pointing that out, God. When he understands he's that he's doing it for Yache's sake, of course there's a glory to pass over. <laughs> he got it all joy, like, yeah, I'm getting to do I'm getting to do what the faith calls for. Praise the higher for that. Anything else there? No. Uh, Proverbs 20 and 3. Okay. It is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. Those two verses really help understand the difference in a man who actually understands the, the calling of the faith and the purpose and the intent. Because he's not a fool. He understands what Allah wants and when there's a situation, he does nothing without discretion, as the precept talks about in Sirach. He goes to get understanding so that he can do like you were talking about. His anger will be deferred because he understands what's going on. That helps us know, as the Lord said, be long suffering and understanding. Get understanding of things so that we can do things. Do the, operate in the right manner and do us right on Talahayim and not getting our passions about it because we know who we're doing it for. Go ahead. Forgive me. That's okay. So that's what he said. Be not ignorant in a small matter or great. Yeah. He puts it in perspective. Yeah. What, what are you talking about? No, what's going on? Okay, so we got a good little dichotomy of a man of understanding or a man who's seeking understanding as opposed to a man who isn't wise and understanding in the faith. So he's going to struggle. He's going to be meddling. He's going to look for issues because he's given to his emotions as a furious man or kindle strife. And he will abound in transgression because he can't control his emotions or he can't stay out of his emotions actually or get out of his emotions when he gets into them so on the other hand we see the unwise in knowledge of Allah will give in to the wrong spirits and they'll find a means of provoking him to get in his feelings and find a problem as it's the spirit of hatred stirring him up can you read Proverbs 10 and 12, please? Hatred stirs up strifes, but love covereth all sins. Amen. Love is the boundary. What Zachwa talked to me about. When love is in the heart, it finds a way to appease strife, pass over transgressions, and defer anger. Then talk with the person about the fault committed so they can understand and hopefully repent of the wrong done. Now, when you have that conversation, Zach was talking to me about this, is not to be justified or get the person to agree, but you have to take the time to process it for yourself, be at peace with what transpired, and let it go, and then talk to the person about the wrong done without seeking a desired outcome but just for true sake of sharing what happened in the experience. And then after you talk about it, if the person hopefully repents for the wrong done, then the man would hide the person's fault after they took care of the situation between one another, not telling anyone else about the person's shortcoming if received. That's how love covers all sins. Can you read Joseph 17 and 2, please? Do ye also therefore love one another, and with long suffering hide ye one another's faults? For Allah delighteth in the unity of brethren, and in the purpose of a heart that taketh pleasure in love. Zakla talked to me about understanding this meaning, that if some fault against us happens, 
you correct a person in love for their sin. And if the correction is received after dealing with the issue, you put it behind you and don't bring it up again, not throwing it in their face or telling others about it, putting the person to shame out of love since y'all already talked about what happened and they repented of the error. Okay. Proverbs 17 and 9. He that covereth for transgression seeketh love. That's how we operate out of love. After talking about the transgression of the person and dealing with the issue, we cover their faults from others, not bringing it up again out of love, so as not to put them to shame. Continue, please. All right, but that's not the purpose. I mean, if we're bringing it up to put them to shame, then we're not walking in love. We're walking in hatred. Because hatred delighteth. What is it? Uh, hatred. Um, I don't want butcher. I know it delighted when a brother fallen. If he stumbled, if or if he sinned venially, it would have him put to death. Hatred yeah. welcome if evil speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it loveth arrogance. So that pride of putting my brother down and lifting myself up would be in my heart if I was operating in hatred to bring up the transgression that they did against me to shame them. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. That's the narcissistic spirits or busybodies, gossipers, and slanderers. They like to repeat a person's faults even after discussing the matter in privacy in a smear campaign to make them look bad and turn folks against them and to uplift themselves to show that they are better in pride, as Zachwa just explained. Seeing the spiritual warfare of the spirits of jealousy and the other spirits aiding the spirit of strife, like pride, anger, wrath, and hatred, a man whether husband or father, has to be on guard against jealousy, strife, and bitterness, and any evil towards his wife, parents, and children. Also, parents and children have to be on guard against strife and jealousy between each other. No one we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places, not flesh and blood, to be taking things personal. Let's continue understanding the spiritual warfare. There is also an element of darkness that creates strife and wrong in men's homes, attacking the whole family and sends hard temper on the spouses. Can you read Testament of Solomon 82, please? The eleventh said, I am called Katanic Kotiel. I create strife and wrongs in men's homes and send on them hard temper. This demon creates strife and wrongs in men's homes, so its efforts are to get the wife and children into hard temper, or to do wrong, or to create an issue for there to be strife. He seeks to do the same to the man himself. Understanding this, couples have to be on guard not to be hasty in temperament, nor as lions to be hard-tempered with their households. Can you read Sirach 7 and 9, please? Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. All right. Be not as a lion in thy house, nor frantic among thy servants. That was Sirach 4 and 30. So, with understanding of this spirit and who it attacks, we can be wise in understanding not to give heed to this demon in the household, Spouses must be on guard against anger to appease strife that may come in the house. Remember, Proverbs 15 and 1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Please take the time to visit the Spirit of Anger lesson to get insight of the hard temper this demon sends so we can be on guard against it with understanding of the remedies to overcome. Can you... Reads Testament Solomon 89, please. I'm going to jump back before we go. 
Okay. Um, when it says in Sirach 7 and 9, it says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. As uh, I'll, hopefully everybody is aware of children um, at a young age. Children at a young age usually get angry very easily or quickly, usually because they don't know how to communicate what they're feeling or what they're experiencing, or they're just hasty because they don't understand what's happening. So you can actually understand why it says, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools, because it shows that you don't understand what's happening, or you're having a problem communicating, or, um, or what's the word, um, or relaying, or you're having a problem formulating your emotions or what you're actually experiencing. Right. So it could be one or two things. Either you don't know what's happening and you're not aware of yourself to understand why what's going on. So you resort to anger or you're not able to formulate your words to express what you're trying to say. So you can see why Sirach 7 and 9 said, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. That's exactly why. That's why we're not supposed to be foolish in any matter. We're supposed to understand, understand ourselves and understand the things around us so that we can actually stay away from the spirit of anger and just communicate. I know for, for my children, um, especially my young my young child, he just has a problem um expressing or formulating what he's trying to say so instead he'll get angry and then i have to slow him down and actually try to get him to process what's actually happening for him to then be able to express it so it's the same with adults many of us have not learned those processes to be able to implement them in adulthood so um, emotionally, many of us are as children. Our emotional intelligence is not high, so we have to learn emotional intelligence so that we will not give place to anger for the lack of what we don't understand, especially within ourselves. I'm done, Kath. That's good. Hmm. Testament of Solomon. You got something, Council? Before we go, well, I was just soaking it in. Got to be able to process things. The better I can process, the better I can stay away from anger. Instead of getting angry when I don't understand. That is good info. Amen. Testament of Solomon 89. The 18th said, I am called Baldemich. I separate wife from husband and bring about a grudge between them. That means couples have to be mindful of getting bitter or resentful towards one another, knowing it's this demon separating them, being unable to forgive one another and let things go. And from what Zach well just explained, these demons, whether Baldemich, Kitana Ketel, whomever, you find you're getting in your feelings, getting frustrated. Remember, that stuff rests in the bosom of fools. We have to be of understanding. We have to be wise in Christ. Something's going on. Let's take a moment to go sit down somewhere and process and understand ourselves and process why I'm feeling to say what's going on for wives cleave to your husbands go get understanding and guidance brothers pray go to your one counselor who you know keeps the law get understanding
Let's do all things with discretion, knowing that we're in a war zone in this life. Beware of this demon because it will use gaslighting and other manipulative tactics to cause the division and bring about a grudge. Remember the faith and stand in truth of reality and not your own thoughts to overcome this demon, nor do not stand in how you feel. Take the time to reason and process. Understand your feelings, even if someone done you wrong, process it, accept it wasn't right, and then remember the law to let it go and stay out of the feeling so it doesn't seep in to cause you to fall at a later time or in that moment. As these admissions, praise the line. Um, this is how we keep the faith. In Ephesians 4, 31, 32, please. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as Allah for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's an amazing thing that these words are spirit. He said, put it away from you. We have to put all this stuff away from inside of us. And also think being kind, tender heart and forgiven for Christ's sake inside of us. This has to be who we are within so that it can be true in our life. Okay. That's an interesting thing because Allah said, with all that getting, get understanding. Right? Mm -hmm. And then he also instructed us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Right? Mm -hmm. The serpent at the beginning, the serpent learned righteousness. The serpent was in the heavens. And then the serpent also learned evil. Because it rebelled and then it learned all the, the wickedness that it also acquired upon the earth. But Allah told us to be wise as serpents. So we're supposed to understand good and evil. We're not only supposed to understand good because then we're not um, vigilant to evil. Or we're not aware of it. So then we can fall to it. So now we have to understand from Adam and, and Eve who ate from the tree of good and evil. We have to understand both good and evil so that we can stand away from evil, keeping the second part of what he commanded us to be harmless as doves. That means that we have to be wise as serpents, knowing good and evil, and harmless as doves, walking in the fruits of the Spirit and walking in Elohim's Spirit. Though we understand good and evil, we have to walk in the good. And that was what Elohim commanded us. With all our getting, get understanding, so that we're not ignorant in any matter that concerns of our soul, that concern that concerneth a spirit that can lead us astray. We're supposed to have understanding. That's why he said the, the children of wrath are, are wiser than the children of, I don't want to. Yeah. The children of this world are, are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Because they know. They know they know evil. And they know good. They just choose to do evil. We're supposed to know good and evil as well and choose to do good. So we have to we have to grow in knowledge and understanding. Khudalaheim said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It's because our lack of humility 
that we can't learn. Because pride suffers one not to hear, but humility suffers one to hear. So it's the lack of humility that actually cripples us from actually acquiring the knowledge that we need in order to become the vessel or the person that we need to be in Elohim. And that's what's going to actually grow us in being kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, having that understanding of how hard it is to come out of those spirits or how hard it is or the process it takes for a person to overcome or get the understanding, we would be more forgiving toward one another. So it takes that understanding and that knowledge and that wisdom to then be able to apply it to actually come out of the snares of darkness or the works of the flesh so that we can actually attain the fruits of the spirit. Well, thank you for that. Let's transition to the important role of the head of the household. With all this and knowing the men have a pivotal role in the family, if a man doesn't put Allah high first for a hedge of protection for his family to build and watch over it, the devil and his spirits will overthrow the house. Can you read Sirach 27 and 3, please? Unless a man hold himself diligently in the fear of the Lord, his house shall soon be overthrown. That's because if we men aren't diligent, our wicked works will eventually catch up to us. And our neglect to have a care for our family, to set an example and speak words of righteousness to help them come out of their struggles, holding them accountable to do right, will catch up to us and the devil will eventually fulfill his will to overthrow the house in the end. We men have to submit to Allah way to be protected and can't be scared to stand for righteousness, even when our family may not have the same view. For a man to lead his family, he has to put Allah first always and can't seek his own desires. Can you read Proverbs 14 and 12, please? There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The man that goes according to his own mind, not adhering to the law and the fruits of it, may think he's on the right path, but the result of our works will show the truth of the matter as the effects of what we do will manifest in us and or our household with unrighteous works that are produced from our lack of obedience. The scriptures show the effects of a man and his family if he doesn't humble himself to walk in the wisdom and nurture of Allah in his law. Let's look at it. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 11, please. But whoso despises wisdom and nurture, he is miserable. This man who despises the nurturing process wisdom takes us through in her nurture to get us where we are submitting to Allah voice, tormenting us with her discipline, and then trying us by her laws and the fruits of the Spirit to submit ourselves to them, will be miserable, unfortunately. Can you read First John 5 and 3 so we can see what's going on with this? For this is the love of Elohim, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. If we look at doing what Elohim instructs us to do as a burden, and the way he asks us to live as a hindrance, we will be miserable, viewing his commandments as grievous. This means we will struggle with sorrow and mental health struggles like anxiety and depression, as opposed to the just, who endure the nurture and faith to get a hold of cheerfulness and sound mind in love, being obedient in all things. And if sorrow does come upon them, they sit upon their bed and reason and pray to get back on track to a sound mind and peace, knowing nothing happens without Allah Hayyam, not letting the sun go down upon their wrath, lest they give place to the devil by staying in their feelings. Let's see the result of a man hating wisdom's nurture. Continue reading, please, in 
Wisdom of Solomon 3 and 11, please. And their hope is vain. So, though the man who despises wisdom may profess hope in Christ, it's vain, because by works is faith shown, and the doers of the law shall be justified, as they sow righteous deeds in hope to reap the resurrection in joy. This means without the fruits of repentance and good works, that hope is vain because there is no evidence of his hope by how he is living his life. Continue, please. Their labors unfruitful and their works unprofitable. There is the fruitless labor and works of the man, unfortunately, since he's going his own way that seems right in his eyes. This man isn't humbly implementing the law to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit. And that means what he does and the efforts he put forth won't profit or won't be profitable or fruitful for him. And unfortunately, this will affect his household too. Let's see it in verse 12 of chapter 3 of Wisdom of Solomon, please. Their wives are foolish. A wife will struggle with unwise decision-making because she is not learning wisdom and understanding in the law to keep from evil under an unrighteous man because he's supposed to be teaching her at home. But his hypocrisy will set a bad example for her and make her more open to foolishness in unfruitful thoughts and works by him not upholding the faith. This is because a blasphemer who speaks well and doesn't do well can make people not believe the gospel. And a woman has her own struggles to overcome, yes, but it's not going to help her get any better if her man is in hypocrisy, not showing her the light by his example. We're supposed to walk in the faith by our actions, and if our actions aren't well, it does not win people over to be converted, so the man's wife will struggle, as he is not sacrificing himself and overcoming his desires to save her. Now we see an unfortunate man here, struggling with his mental health and overcoming his sins, and his unrighteous wife, both of them struggling in a household through the lack of nurturing the faith of the Lord. Let's see how a parent or parents not doing right affect the children. Can you continue, please? And the children wicked. The children will struggle too because their father didn't take the time to overcome himself to understand what it takes to teach his wife and children how to overcome. Nor is their mother guiding the house in the right way as she is not being led the right way herself by her husband. Or... He isn't holding her accountable by not letting her have her own way, by gently and meekly having righteous discourse daily to admonish her when she transgresses, or teaching her a better way of doing things in the fruits. Or it may be that she isn't holding herself accountable to uphold what's right on Tala Hayam and her husband, though he may be teaching her the right thing to do. In either case, of what may have the wife in the struggle and or the husband struggling. This leaves the children in an unhealthy environment where they learn a lot of bad habits and behaviors and experience traumas that leads them to unrighteous behaviors and mindsets. Thus, a woman can pluck her house down with the works of her hands, and more importantly, a man not doing right gets his family overthrown. Can you read Proverbs 14 and 11? If you don't have anything, please. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown. If we don't repent and do works worthy of repentance, we will hurt ourselves and our family as Hermas did. But if we turn on Talahayim, he will restore our household to stand in the faith just as he did for Hermas when he repented and put the work in for himself and became diligent to guide his family. You have examples of women converting their husbands as well by their good works, like Drusiana in the Acts of John. So we know it can go both ways. Here today, we're just focusing on the men here as change mostly begins with the men. Continue, please. But the house of the righteous shall stand. As a man focuses to keep the commandments, to get wisdom, 
his house will eventually be built up to stand, being established by understanding. So men, focus on being established in righteousness to win over your wife. We know the woman is the weaker vessel, so grow in more patience with her. Speak with her in a way that's easily entreated, so she may receive thy words and be converted. I remember, Zach, are you telling me about how it, sometimes it's easier to have a conversation with a person when you make it about someone else for them to grasp a thing? To help people in wisdom when talking with spouses or talking with others. If you need guidance on how to have a conversation with whomever, reach out to your counselor that keeps the commandments. Continuing yeah, Proverbs. Oh, go ahead. It helps not to take things personally uh, or like or take it as an attack. Um, a lot of times, you know, people are in their different respective places in their walk and their journey. So you just have to use wisdom on where a person is and how a person, um, what works for a person because everybody's different. So some people you can have a straightforward conversation and love, and some people you have to make it very um, gentle for them to be able to receive it so that they don't take it in a negative fashion. So just have to have wisdom. So definitely cons consult your counselor that you know to keep the keep the commandments, like Brother Cosmo said, and walk in the fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. When you said it, I remember Elahayim even does it because, like, when Samuel had to reprove Saul, he pretty he spoke to him straightly. He's like, mm -hmm. "You've done foolishly, <laughs> right?" <laughs> but then with David, <laughs> Nathan came and used the story <laughs> because the word he's like, "There was a story of this and that, and, that. and then it worked to get David to understand what happened." So right. Elahayim does the same wisdom. <laughs> Proverbs 24 and 3, please. Through wisdom is in house builded, and by understanding is it established. Amen. And we can't get wisdom without keeping the commandments, right? And understanding is in the law, because to depart from evil, that is understanding, according to a the testimonies in the book of Job, if I'm not mistaken. So by precept, we need Ahaya to build a house through wisdom, his Holy Spirit. On the foundation of Christ, our Lord, walking in the understanding of their commandments, laws, and spirits to keep from evil will establish the house. Once established on the rock and foundation of Christ, Having Ahaya build a house through wisdom, his Holy Spirit, the house will see a change for good by walking uprightly. Can you read Proverbs 14, 11, please? The rest of it. But, Sorry. but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. See that putting in the work to go through the process that the Holy Spirit takes us through, tormenting us with her discipline, and trying us by her laws and the fruits will be beneficial to cause the whole house to flourish in good works. With all this, we hope that helps for understanding our importance to the family and the importance of our responsibility to get it right ourselves through Elohim's process and submitting to his law for our salvation and others. All right. Anything else there, Zachwa? Nope, we're good to go. All right, let's get into the importance of parents raising the family right. Understanding it's a process. Firstly, a man has to teach himself the faith to walk in the commandments, as we've been talking about, that Christ may be with him to be able to teach his family as it starts with him being accountable to do right like we discussed in the last lesson. Can you read Epistle of Polycarp? To the Philippians 4 and 6, please. And teach ourselves first to walk according to the commandments of the Lord. A man can't hold his wife to a standard without living up to the standard himself. 
as we first must teach ourselves to walk according to the commands before we can teach anyone else. All right, continue, please. And then you're wise to walk likewise according to the faith that is given to them in charity and in purity. A wife is the weaker vessel, so that means she has a man to guide her to walk according to the measure of faith given unto her to be perfect in charity, which is the bond of perfectness in the law. A man also teaches her the following to keep her charity pure. Can you continue reading, please? Loving her own husband with all sincerity and all others alike with all temperance. So, after a man starts walking in the commandments, he will bring forth the fruits of faith, charity, and purity to be able to teach his wife those spirits and to love him in sincerity and others alike in temperance. He can also guide her to bring up the kids in the fear of the Lord, as she would be walking in the Lord's fear herself. Can you continue reading, please? And to bring up the children in the instruction and fear of the Lord. Parents have to walk in the Lord, keeping his law for children to listen and obey them unto righteousness. So just as a man can't hold his wife to a standard he isn't upholding himself, both parents can't hold their kids to a standard they aren't upholding themselves to avoid the spirit of hypocrisy. Zach well touched on that a bit earlier too. This stuff is spiritual, so what spirit we walk in affects our family and children who are more easily influenced by the spirits. So they'll struggle to obey words of righteousness if the parents are not walking in the Lord for his spirits to be with the children, helping them to listen and obey. It's important to raise kids right, because if we're not raising the children right, it's a loss and a dishonor to the parents. Can you read Sirach 22 and 3, please? An evil nurtured man is the dishonor of his father that begat him, and a foolish daughter is born to his loss. So not nurturing a child in the faith to leave them to themselves will be a dishonor to us, and our daughter would be a loss to us in the same way. This is why raising our kids right grieve the devil, because we lead them to honor and be of value to Allah Hayyam. He's tough. Uh, Sirach 30 and 3, please. He that teacheth his son grieveth the enemy, and before his friends he shall rejoice of him. It's interesting how you talked about the difference in the love of Allah versus the love of the world or the love of the devil, where we know from the beginning the devil's goal is to destroy us all. And it grieves him seeing a person do us right because he know that person is going to lead their family to be valuable to Allah Hayyam. So it frustrates him out of that spirit of hatred that he deals in. But then on the right hand side of things, remember, a man is Christ's friend if he does what he commands him. So we will be able to rejoice before the Lord of our children seeing them go the right way and the devil will languish at the family's prosperity in the law and the fruits of the spirit likewise a man teaching his daughter she won't be a loss to a man but she will be profitable as a help me in her wisdom that she learned according to the law being taught by her parents having her father instruction and her mother's example can you read Sirach 22 and 4, please? A wife's daughter shall bring an inheritance to her husband, but she that liveth dishonestly is her father's heaviness. Just as pampering a son and leaving him to himself will lead to him being stubborn, discontent, and willful, which will bring a man to heaviness, it can likewise happen if a man doesn't raise his daughter right to live honestly in the faith, leaving her to herself to learn the manipulation and dishonest tactics of the spirits of the devil that attack us from our youth 
and fornication that leads young people astray, as Reuben talked about. Giving daughters the nurture and the faith is essential as her relationship with her father and her brothers, if she has them, can affect her future relationships with men altogether, as we saw how Asenath being raised without respect for men unfortunately also didn't respect her father and other men being bold in her perspective. Kiri Sirach 22 and 5, please. She that is bold dishonoreth both her father and her husband, but they both shall despise her. The way kids come up has an effect on their future relationship, so it's important to train them up in the right ways. As you see, if a child was emboldened in pride in their upbringing, they would dishonor their spouses, and that lack of reverence will manifest in their relationships as she wouldn't honor her husband just as she didn't honor her father. Remember though, even Asenath was delivered from her struggles. So there is deliverance for any woman who may be found in such struggles of idolatry and the problems they cause. Anything else there, Zachwa? No, I'm good. It was good. With understanding, let's jump into looking at things for the children. Let's look at children's journey and decisions. Now, unfortunately, though you may teach the right way, some kids reject the instruction of their parents through their pride, and it's a reproach to their own kindred. Can you read Sirach 22 and 10, please? But children being haughty through disdain, and want of nurture do stain the nobility of their kindred. That day you see, unfortunately, some kids, they get, those spirits get a hold of them early. Through that disdain, it will cause them to not want that nurture or that haughtiness will lead them away from Allah So you have kids who are haughty being given over to hatred because they lack the nurture of the Lord outlined in the laws either by hating listening to their parents or their parents left them to themselves. In either case, the lack of nurture leaving them to be given over to the evil spirits make the kindred look bad. On the other hand, for kids, Allah has mercy on those who he wills to open their eyes to see the struggles of their parents and not choose the ways even if those kids see their parents aren't living right. The kids doing right covers the baseness of their parents' shortcomings. Can you read Sirach 22 and 9, please? If children live honestly and have wherewithal, they shall cover the baseness of their parents. So that means Allah wants children to do right and confess their parents' faults and then do good works, live it honestly themselves to cover their parents' shortcomings in his righteousness. So you can see how even though the parents didn't do right, he still has mercy to lead the kids aright to cover the mishaps or misdealings of their parents. Can you read Leviticus 26 and 39, please? And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. And also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. So a kid was struggling their own iniquities and the iniquities of their parents taught to them to walk after in the errors of their hearts. Continue, please. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary unto me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they then accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember, and I will remember the land. And the higher that Allah will circumcise thine heart, and the heart of thy seed, to love Ahiah that Allah with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Amen. Amen. So when a child realizes their own shortcomings and their parents and confesses both, 
and takes accountability that Allahayim did bring the afflictions upon them for their sins and accept that his punishment for their iniquity was just, not holding a grudge or resenting whatever happened or what someone did, but seeing that it was from Allahayim and they accept what happened in humbleness of heart, counting him righteous in it all, and then putting in the work to do righteousness and live uprightly and bring forth fruits worthy of repentance, he will remember the covenant and turn things around. So for children, doing what's right, despite the shortcomings of your parents, confessing their faults to Allah and confessing your own faults, and doing the things commanded to do in the law covers your parents or our parents' shortcomings, if we know of them, in Allah righteousness and helps bring a child out of their own iniquities so we can see how truly focusing on pleasing Ahaya in everything and getting things right is truly honoring our parents as it helps make up for their mistakes before Allah while gaining life for yourself by keeping the commandments. Let's take a look at that in the law or in the prophets. Ezekiel 18 and 9, please. I have walked in my statutes and have kept my judgments to do truly. He is just, he shall surely live, saith Adonai Ahaya. So we see here, first and foremost, anybody that walks in Ahaya's statutes and keeps his judgments, they deal truly. And they're just, and they're going to live. All right, now let's see how it goes when somebody comes from an environment where their parents, unfortunately, weren't living according to the ways of Allah Hayyam. Can you read Ezekiel 18 and 14, please? Now, lo, if he beget a son that seeth all his father's sins, which he hath done, and considereth and doeth no such like, that have not eaten up the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, hath not defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath oppressed any, hath not withholding the pledge, neither hath spoiled by violence, but hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with a garment, that hath taken off his hand from the poor, that hath not received usury nor increase, have executed my judgments, have walked in my statutes. He shall not die for the iniquity of his father. He shall surely live. It's this here. We get to see that we all get to choose. That child, Allah Haim opened and sought to see what his father was doing wasn't right. And he reasoned, he considereth, as verse 14 says, and doeth not such like. So he saw, he got understanding of what was going on. He reasoned and decided he wasn't going to do it. But mind you, he didn't decide he wasn't going to do it and then go do his own thing. Because that would have just led him into another, serving another idol. He submitted himself to Allah ways. Because that's there's only two sides to this. It's either for Allah Hayyam's law or for the laws of the devil. You see, he did what Allah Hayyam commanded. And in order for him to have life, he executed Ahaya's judgments. He implemented them. There were actions involved in his repentance and his change of mind and change of course in his life. And he walked in the statutes. That gets him life. And anybody who chooses to do so. Continue in verse 19. If you don't have something. Yet say ye. Why? Doeth not the son bear the iniquity of the father? When the son hath done that which is lawful and right. And hath kept all my statutes. And hath done them. He shall surely live. So you see. He's not going to bear the iniquity because he's done all our higher statutes and what's lawful and right. He confessed his father's faults because that's in the commandments to do. And he didn't continue in them. 
He accepted whatever punishment had came from living that lifestyle and turned unto Lahayim so that he could get that circumcision of heart. He's going to live. So sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters, men and women of all nations, no matter what background or upbringing we come from, if we turn from our sins, we can live. Continue verse 21, please. But if the wicked would turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Please. All his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. And his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live. Amen. He took accountability. He acknowledged, he implemented, and acted. And he stayed in it until he actually got a hold of the righteousness of Allah. I am. There's nothing going to be mentioned unto him in the judgment. Okay. In closing, men taking the initiative to get understanding of the faith and walking in it is truly beneficial to the whole family. As we have seen how it can have an impact for good or bad. Also, hopefully we get some insight as to what true love is as a parent as well to hold children accountable and be patient as they have their process to go through for their salvation as well. We're good, Zephyr? Yep, we're good. Now let's get into accountability. Okay. On the home stretch here, how to serve the Lord in the household. Firstly, Understand everyone is under Christ as his servants. Matthew 23, verse 8 and verse 10, please. But be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. Okay. Continue. Matthew 23 and 10. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. So, Christ is all of our Lord and Master, while we are all brothers and sisters. That means, though a man's wife is his possession and help me, belonging to him to nurture, guide, and rejoice in, she is also his sister. Also a wife, though her husband is her head and Lord that she has a desire unto, and submits to his rule over her as the Lord commanded. Christ is also her Lord too, and her husband is also her brother that she cherishes. Likewise, parents have honor and authority over their children. Yet, and still, Christ is Lord of the whole family. So our children are our brothers and sisters in Christ, who we ought to entreat as brethren and as sisters in our purity, not lording over the Lord's flock, but rather being an example unto our wives and children in the gentleness and meekness of our Lord. Allah Hayyam bought us as man buys a servant. So let's not be respecters of men, being servants unto them and doing what's right in their sight, but let's be servants unto Allah Hayyam, no matter what, may seem right in the eyes of men. Can you read 1 Corinthians 7 and 23, please? Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. Since our master Christ purchased us all, male and female, brother and sister, son and daughter, we all ought to focus on serving him and Allah not men. This means we ought to have Allah Hayim in all of our thoughts and his fear before us in all of our works to firstly make sure we are doing what's right to him so that we may please him and it will end up pleasing men in the right way unto edification and glorifying Allah Hayim if we are keeping his commandments with the fruits of his spirit. Zachwa, have you got uh, anything? Yes. Um... When Casa said 
this means we ought to have Allah in all our thoughts and it's fear before us and all our works to firstly make sure we're doing what's right to him so that we may please him and we'll end up pleasing men the right way to edification. I was speaking to Kasifo the other day and we were talking about a um a um horizontal and vertical graph where in examining yourself or examining your works or examining what it is that you should do in a in a situation or um or in an environment there should always be a crossing there should always be a law that crosses the fruit of the spirit so in every situation you should be examining okay what is the law that needs to be implemented here what is the fruit of the spirit that needs to be implemented here and these things they should form a cross so that you can understand okay i need to i need to implement this law and this fruit of the spirit goes with this law and then if you want to add to your understanding add the wisdom scriptures in the graph for the for the two dichotomies for the law and the fruits of the spirit so that you can fully have understanding and walking in all situations or circumstances with wisdom and understanding and that actually keep you from falling off into sin or going another direction if that's what you truly desire because you have to desire the law. You have to desire the fruits of the spirit to be able to keep it. You know, because if it's grievous to you, then you're not going to keep it. Right. So those two things actually form that graph that actually keeps us within the confines of the law and, and the spirit. Yeah. The precept in um, Acts of Peter, Peter talks about the word being the beam, the upright beam, and the nail being right there in the center holding the word. And you remember what the I other thing was? Go to it. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> it is interesting how it's going. Point out. Or expound on what we're talking about today okay this is in the acts of peter chapter 34 this is when peter's on the cross this actually talks about our conversion actually so what you're talking about is yeah. a con conversion of our mind. So kind of got to read it a good bit. That's okay. It says, and when, this is when Peter got hung on the cross. And when they had hanged him up after the manner he desired, he began to say, he asked him to hang him upside down on the cross. Ye men, unto whom it belongeth to hear, hearken to that which I shall declare unto you. At this especial time as I hang here, Learn ye the mystery of all nature and the beginning of all things. What it was. For the first man whose race I bear in mine appearance, or of the race of whom I bear the likeness, fell, was born head downwards, and showed forth a manner of birth such as was not heretofore. For it was dead having no motion. He then, being pulled down, who also cast his first state down upon the earth, established this whole disposition of all things being hanged upon an image of the creation, wherein he made the things of the right hand into the left, and the left hand into the right, and changed about all the marks of their nature, so that he thought those things that were not fair to be fair, and those that were in truth evil to be good. So you can see the conversion. When man fell, basically everything turned upside down. 
evil became good and good became evil. Concerning which the Lord saith in a mystery, unless you make the things of the right hand as those of the left, and those of the left as those of the right, and those that are above as those below, and those that are behind as those that are before, you shall not have knowledge of the kingdom. In a nutshell, I say we have to have a complete 180 and change things back to the original order of the law of Allah and being what's right in every respect. This thought, therefore, have I declared unto you, and the figure wherein you now see me hanging is the representation of that man that first came unto birth. Ye therefore, my beloved, and ye that hear me and that shall hear ought to cease from your former error and return back again for it is right to mount upon the cross of christ who is the word stretched out the one and only of whom the spirit saith for what else is christ but the word the sound of allah Hayim? so that the word is the upright beam where i am crucified so the word is upright beam, and the sound is that which crosseth it, the nature of man. So the cross, the upright beam is the word, and man, us, the flesh, we're the, the beam. And the nail which holdeth the cross tree unto the upright in the midst thereof is the conversion and repentance of man. So putting it in perspective, that Zachary talks about find that cross where the law crosses with the fruits of the spirit. When we get that center point, we're actually holding on to conversion and repentance. When we stay centered on the law and the fruits. So hopefully that helps for understanding what we're doing when we take the time and slow down to ensure we have the law and the fruits of the spirit in us. And in what we're doing and what we're thinking. Anything else on that? Thank you. Mm -mm. I went first. Praise Allah. <laughs> With this understanding, that helps us for, uh, for knowing what we're doing and why we're doing it. We have to seek. What a glorify Allah I am by doing so. Because it's the only way to actually hear him and receive and believe what he's talking about and asking us to do. Can we look at John 5 and 44, please? How can ye believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from Allah I am only? Catch this here. Seeking honor to serve men's desires that are not according to the will of Allah Hayyam, to receive honor from them hinders us from growing because we need to be single-minded seeking the honor that comes from Allah Hayyam, only to believe and truly walk in the faith. When we have that single focus like our Lord Christ pleasing our heavenly parents, they will not forsake us because we're doing what pleases them like our Lord did. Can you read John 8 and 29, please? And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Knowing the focus as service of Christ for us all, we have to be strong to endure our trials to grow and please our Allah and our Lord in this life, getting the mastery over all evil. Can you read Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 to 5, to see what the calling is for servants of Christ? Thou therefore endure hardness, as a good soldier of Yahweh Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. The affairs of this life, in the lust of the flesh is what we have to come out of from being entangled in so we can please Christ who chose us to be soldiers. Okay, continue, please. 
That one's an interesting concept. Okay. It says, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Because when, when you're a soldier and you're actually like in the army or whatever the case is, the world is, is not your concern. You're focused on war. And that's it. Yeah. Because if you're not, you could die. Because you're, right. you're, you're in your emotions, not paying attention to what's going on on the battlefield. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. We can't get the victory in this battle without striving according to the law. So we have to learn it and how the adversary works against it to be wise as serpents, knowing how evil works, knowing both good and evil, but harmless as doves walking in the fruits of the spirit, delivering us from the evil temptations and the situations in love. That's major. And remember, we have to want it. Zach, well, I just said not too long ago about how we can know it, but we have to want it to be able to actually retain it and grow in it. And he had came to mind at that time when he said it, that, um, what's his name? The devil, the serpent even. The devil knows the law, but he doesn't want it. So he doesn't remember it when it comes to changing so we can understand, like, when we're struggling to remember or know or keep to mind what needs to be done or seek after what needs to be done according to Allah Haim's law, it brings about the opportunity to sit, take some time to reason on what desires hindering us from wanting it with all our heart so that we may retain it. Okay. Don't have anything on that, Zach. Well, can no, I'm ready to go. Matthew 10 and 16, please. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. As we grow in wisdom and pleasing our Allah and our Lord, we will become strong. And then we can truly help others by applying the fruits of the Spirit to help edify them by our examples or words in faith and love. Can you read Romans 15, 1 and 2, please? Right. So our our job is to be strengthened, to, to learn the wisdom and knowledge of how to apply the fruits of the Spirit in different circumstances, also gaining the wisdom and understanding and knowledge of things so that we're not ignorant in a, in a small matter or a great so that we can actually show people how they can they can apply it to having the understanding ourselves to be able to give it to another. Amen. You said Romans 15 and 1? Yes, please. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. You remember Yache himself, he did this in that he taught the law of Allah by his works. In uh, one of the Testament of the Patriots, they mentioned that. So the gospel is about our walk. We, we can do a lot of teaching by just setting an example. Right? As Paul even came in the spirit of wisdom, not of words. So we see here, pleasing Allah in singleness of mind, seeking after the honor that comes from him by striving to keep the law and overcoming our lusts to please him will help us become strong in the spirit so that we can also please men in the right way unto edification, bearing their infirmities. When we see they are struggling with something, or overcome by something, we put on more of the fruits of the Spirit to please Allah and edify them by our works, 
which will please them in the end when they come to repentance and realize what we were doing to help them come out of the snares of the devil. So in seeking to please Allah Hayyam, we have to have a high value and reverence for our master. First Timothy 6 and 1, please. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor. Let the name of Allah Hayyam and his doctrine be not blasphemed. That first step of really honoring Christ our master to obey him is important so that Ahaya's name and doctrine isn't blasphemed. With honor for him, we have to do everything unto him, knowing he will reward us for what we do. Can you read Colossians 3, verse 23 to 25, please? And whatsoever you do, do it heartily. As to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that, my bad. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive. I'm sorry, I, I read that one verse and I was like, "That's good." I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. <laughs> it, it was good. I'm, I'm gonna drink my tea after that. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. And there is no respect to persons. That's important. We're here learning how to learn how the enemy works, learning the laws, learning how spirits work, specifically learning how they work against us and in us, or what pleasures we have that gives them place in us, because we have to understand ourselves. We have to be wise as serpents. We got to know everything that can cause us to fall. And then look and see, after we get understanding ourselves, look and see what can cause others to fall too. And then stay in a place of humility because whether what we understand doesn't absolve us from the responsibility with Allah Hayyam. He's not a respecter of persons. So, do it heartily unto him, not unto man. Whether man is doing right or wrong by us, let our works be unto him. Because we know we're going to receive a reward for whatever we're doing, regardless of what somebody else does. Okay? Knowing he doesn't respect persons, let's be mindful not to oppress anyone. Can you read... Leviticus 25 and 17, please. I'm going to ask something real quick. For sure. You can't get caught up in how someone views you either. Because someone may view you in a negative light. But you have to understand that whatever you're doing, you have to do it unto Allah. I am. No matter how somebody may view you, how they may perceive you, how they may even speak slander against you or they may say things that's not true you have to you have to understand that Allah Hayyam is the judge so they can hold on to that if that's what they choose to do but they're going to be judged for that you have to continue moving forward and walking forward and doing what's right no matter what anyone else does. And I pray that you hold fast to that. Amen. That's um, good. Leviticus 25 and 17. You shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy Elohim, for I am Ahia, your Elohim. Let's see what oppressing means so we can be sure we have understanding of it to keep from it as servants of the Lord and brothers and sisters of one another. The definition is 3238, H3238, that is. It means a primitive root to rage or be violent. By implication, to suppress, to maltreat, destroy, thrust out by oppression or thrust out by oppressing, 
or to be thrust out by your press or be proud, vex, do violence. So oppression comes by falling into spiritual fornication, operating in the spirits of pride to fall into hatred, anger, wrath, envy, or jealousy, either of which can lead us to be rageful, violent, trying to suppress people to subdue them to our own will instead of doing what Allah Hayyam said to do, remaining in the fruits to let him work on them in his gentleness, we would also be led to maltreat folks, which would destroy them because our ill treatment will turn them away from the faith because of our abusive or controlling treatment of them. Or we would vex them unrighteously, not walking in the fruits of the law, when dealing with them. So how do we avoid oppressing one another? Can you read the next verse in verse 18, please? Wherefore, ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land in safety. By doing his statutes, keeping his judgments and doing them, we won't oppress we won't be oppressive in his sight as we are seeking to serve him, not men, and we will be in safety. Now we see <clears throat> doing the statutes and judgments and keeping the judgments for our perspective will keep us from oppressing one another in hatred. Now that we have some foundation that we are all servants of Christ, and we all should seek the honor that comes from Allah Hayyam in singleness of mind by doing his statutes and judgments to please him and please men by edifying them in his ways through our actions and words in love and faith. Let's see the guidance on how we are to interact with one another in the faith or to help one another come out of the struggle of the lust of the flesh. Can you read Colossians 4 and 1, please? Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. So anyone that has authority over others, like a wife, children, or servants, keep our master in mind to be equal and just. Okay, continue, please. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing Allah. This is great because if we happen, we're about to go into what eye service means. And we're also, if you happen to find yourself identifying with what this thing is, it's good to know the spirit behind it is man pleasing so that we can confess that fault and start to work on overcoming that, okay? Is G3787, the definition of eye service? The Thayer's definition is service performed only under the master's eyes. Or, for the master's eye usually stimulates to greater diligence. His absence, on the other hand, renders sluggish. Strong's definition is sight labor that is that needs watching so that labor has to be watched in order for it to be good labor it's also defined as remissness eye service the word remiss means lacking care or attention to duty negligent so we are not to be like this if we are serving from the heart unto Allah Hayyam. okay this Can I give I, an example? Please, go ahead. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure everybody's pretty savvy to work on a job. And you know that time where the upper management may come to visit your job or to see what's going on. They'll walk around and it's like everybody's like hands on deck. Like, okay, we, everybody got to, everything got to be right. We got to make sure we're doing everything right. Every, and they're, and the managers are just kind of like being a little like overbearing 
because it's not how they usually deal each and every day, that's eye service or man pleasing. It's not genuine. Right. And this is essential to put in perspective because we're being taught we do everything as unto the Lord, knowing from him we receive the reward because we're his servants that he bought with the price of his blood. There's no hiding from his eyes. He always sees. So hopefully we take that in consideration to do what's right unto him in everything because he it's no hiding from him right the next verse goes into that Ephesians 6 and 6 please not with eye service as men pleasers but as the service of Christ doing the will of Elohim from the heart with good will doing service Ask to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So anyone subject to another, obeying all things that are lawful in the fruits of the Spirit, to do sincerely in sickness of heart unto Allah, I am fair in him. Be genuine. Not just doing service to please people when they are around or are looking, but genuinely do it for Allah sake, knowing he sees all at all times within us and when no one is around. And our reward for our actions will come from the Lord, regardless of what others think of us or how others may be treating us. As servants, men and women, we have to obey Christ in all things sincerely. Not just with eye service, but not obeying when we're in our private environments or in our hearts, not understanding. He can't be deceived by an outward show since he looks after the inward man and not the outward appearance. And he weighs the spirits that wear. Women, be subject to your husbands in all things sincerely, not with eye service, only obeying them when they can see you or are around. Children. Be subject to your parents in the Lord in all things genuinely, not just when they're around or can see you. Servants do service unto your employers sincerely, not only just when they can see you or are around. All right, Ephesians 6 and 5, please. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. So men, serve Christ in fear and trembling. Women, likewise, and serve your husbands in the same fear and trembling as unto Christ. Because how you serve him, your Lord, shows how you actually serve Christ. I think there was a lesson we talked about in partiality, where how we interact with men is how we interact with Allah Hayyam. How you do one thing is how you do everything. Amen. Children, serve your parents in fear and trembling as unto Christ as well. Now men, being stewards of the house, beware of the spirits that cause us to oppress others. Can you read Ephesians 6 and 9, please? And ye, and ye masters, do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect the persons with him. So men and any person in authority over others do service in fear and trembling heartily unto the Lord, remembering he is without respect of persons, so we have to be mindful not to get into any oppressive spirit, to be threatening someone in our feelings, or threatening them to control them in fear. All right. Go That's ahead. That's a good one for parents. For bearing yeah. threatening. It's a good one for parents. Right. We just we we supposed to talk to our children as brothers and sisters. You wouldn't threaten your brother, or your sister. 
Allah am willing. Allah am learning not to. Allah am says that uh, he how he talks. Where is it at? Even Allah am talks gently. In Second Edges one and twenty eight, it says. Thus saith the Almighty Lord, have I not prayed you as a father his son, as a mother her daughters, and a nurse her young babes? So even as Allah commands to entreat, he entreats. So we ought to entreat and forbear threatening so that we may be as our Allah be perfect as he is perfect. That's good. Thank you. Right, Amen. Home stretch here, and accountability. Now know we are servants. Let's look into helping those struggling in the household. Now we got some understanding of how to be good servants of Christ in a household. Now let's look at how Allah Hayyam teaches to help servants struggling with evil to help them come out of the struggle. Let's get into guidance on helping understand how Allah Hayyam helps us as his servants, how we can help ourselves become good servants, and how we can help our wives, children, and or our servants come out of the struggle as well. Can you read Sirach 33 verse 24? Let me start from there, please. Father, a wand and burdens are for the ass, and bread, correction, and work for a servant. It's for a servant to help him grow into a better person. Everything is for our best interest from Allah Hayyam. As you remember in Barnabas 19 and 6, look at everything as good, knowing that nothing happens without Allah Hayyam, essentially. Continue, please. If thou set thy servant to labor, thou shalt find rest. Give him work so he can get his experiences for his growth, and you will find rest in the results of his growth from his work experiences as well. And we're going to get into what work experiences we're talking about, okay? Eventually. Continue, please. But if thou let him go idle, he shall seek liberty. If you enable him, by just letting him do nothing or do what he wants to do, he'll end up seeking liberty to do as he wills. Continue, please. A yoke and a collar do bow the neck. So are tortures and torment for an evil servant. This is speaking of the punishments that will be in the judgment for evil servants. So a master has to consider the end of what will happen if a servant stayed in evil. So you have to help him while he is alive by putting him to work instead of leaving him idle and free to stay in his struggles. Can you read verse 27, please? Just for the record, this is referring to both men and women who are servants of Allah Hayyam. Just so everybody can know, just apply it to whatever it needs to be applied to. Thank um, you. Sirach 33 and 27. Send him to labor that he be not idle. For idleness teacheth much evil. So the law is teaching to hold a person, whether man, woman, husband, child, and wife, accountable. And don't enable them to give them freedom to be idle doing their own will. Because leaving them to themselves... They'll learn more evil since that's what idleness does. Can you read it? Sirach 30 and 8, please. And horse not broken becometh headstrong, and the child left to himself will be willful. Remember, we talked earlier about we may be adults in age, but not in spirit. This can happen to any of us. That idle time of being left to ourselves whether child or servant, husband or wife, we'll learn to get further into our bad behaviors. So, 
You have to put us to work to help us overcome our struggles. This is also helping understand what Allah Hayyam does to us to help us grow. Okay. Continue, please, in Surah 33 and 28. Set him to work as it's fit for him. This is key. When we were talking about putting the servants to work, it's not just talking about give them a job, make them do some random thing. It's specific. Allah Hayyam sets us to work as is fit for us, fit to help us grow. And we ought to do the same. This is where you remember we were talking about in the segment on um, understanding true repentance in Allah Hayyam's sight or something like that, that mm -hmm. Allah Hayyam, as a parent, he took the time to understand us and saw what we needed. He knew the contrariness of our heart and that we wouldn't repent unless we went through what we needed to. If you have a spouse, a servant, a child that's struggling with adhering to the fate or cleaving to Allah Hayyam, do nothing without discretion. You got to get understanding of that person. Pray to Allah Hayyam. Go speak to the counselor that you know keeps the commands. Find out what work that persons need to have so that they that's fit for them to help them change. You know, what needs to be implemented to help them grow. Okay? So that you don't do things and then make it worse because you didn't go according to Allah Hayyam's wisdom. So this verse here says, set him to work that is fit for him. So put him in an environment or that person, put that person in an environment that's fit for what they struggle with, where they can grow on overcoming their struggle. This means give them a position that helps them face their struggles to learn how to overcome it. This doesn't mean give them a position that would have or cause them to fall to their struggle or give them a position where they can be idle to continue in their struggle without having to change. For example, a man struggling with pride, give him a position where he has to be humble or learns to deal humbly or learns to be humble. But don't give him a position where he doesn't have to have humility himself or he doesn't have to humble himself or he doesn't have to work on humility because it's not in his best interest since he won't change if he isn't put to work on his struggle and he'll just end up in torments and tortures in the judgment for being evil. Now, when you put him to work on what's fit for him to help him overcome his struggle, you have to pay attention to how he responds to being held accountable to work on himself. And this goes for any person that you have to pay attention to how they're responding, what they're doing. Remember, we have to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Continue verse 28, please. If he be not obedient, put on more heavy fetters. Fetters are chains for restraint. It's a figure of speech. But if he is not being obedient or if that person isn't being obedient, hold them more accountable, not giving them a way out of putting the work into change or practicing what's needful for their change. You see, the person may be disobedient because that person doesn't want to change and they'll try you to see what they can get away with. And if you just leave that person to be idle after they resist the work you give them to help them, they will just be taught more evil, just like the scriptures show idleness and being left to ourselves does. So you have to show you're going to hold them more accountable when they resist you. So they can know that they will not be able to manipulate their way out of the work they need to do to change. All of this has to be done in the fruits of the spirit, staying out of our emotions, lest some root of bitterness causes us to fall. Because this is the same way Allah Hayyam operates. You may find in your life where you've been put in an environment where that thing you're struggling with, you're being tried in it. And 
you're you might have wanted to get out of the situation because of the effect it was having on you, but Allah isn't letting you out of it because he's gonna hold you accountable to change. He's gonna keep you there until you grow in that area you need to grow in. And if you kick against the pricks, <laughs> he's gonna give you what you need to know. He's not changing it. You gotta actually grow and make the change. And then when you grow from that experience, then he'll put you in another experience to help you grow in whatever else there is or perfecting whatever it is he's working with you on to help you. Just for understanding that what we're reading about is how Allah deals and it's good for us to deal as he deals because it's, it's right and it's love. And seeing as servants how we ought to do things in the fruits to actually help people. Let's read. Second Timothy two and twenty four to twenty six. If you don't have anything to add, please. Already, okay. and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If Allah and pure venture would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So you see, when, if it comes a situation where that person is disobedient and they're testing to see what they can get away with, it isn't a time to get out of the fruits, but it's a time to put on more humility, not to strive, but to be gentle, aptitude and patient and meekness, talking to them, instructing them, still holding them accountable, but not coming out of the fruits. Because you're hoping Allah Hayyam give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Because as you all may recall from lessons before, when we get out of the fruits of the spirit, that spirit that's at work in that person, like it, that God talked about, give off reproving him lest thou sin doubly. Because then that spirit that wasn't operating correctly enters into us and causes us to fall and helps justify that person staying where they are. Instead of being as Christ, who set an example of Allah, no matter what anybody else was doing, so that we could come to repentance. So we have to be gentle, patient, and meek towards all, teaching in hopes they come out of the snares of the devil. Notice, the right heart is doing things in the right spirit, helping with hopes that they change, remembering you don't want the servant to end up in torments, whether it be child, spouse, or whomever, because they didn't come out of the snares of the devil. According to the laws of light, we have to speak truth with our neighbor, with love, to speak about when they transgress against us in meekness. Can you read Barnabas 19 and 4, please? Thou shalt not make a difference in a person to reprove him for a transgression. Thou shalt be meek, thou shalt be quiet, thou shalt be fearing the words which thou hast heard. Thou shalt not bear a grudge against thy brother. So you see, this is the fulfilling of the law. The spirit we do it in has to be right. Okay. This can be a trying time, but we have to be sure not to get into our feelings about how the servant may be operating or where that person is in their walk. Because getting in our feelings can cause things to backfire. But with pride come the contention. So for one to pull another out of the struggle, there has to be humility. Not to take things personal, but focus on what's right in the sight of Allah Hayyam, And holding yourself to that standard, no matter what may be going on between you and that servant or person. If you don't have anything, verse 29 of Sirach 33, please. This is a good time to sit on your bed. Um, this is a good time to understand when, when it says, Thou shalt not make a difference in a person to reprove him for a transgression and staying out of your feelings. Um, it's good to deal with the situation after you have gathered yourself 
and you're not in your emotions. Um, the scripture says, sit on thy bed, um, um, be angry and sin not. And then it's the other one says, um, sit on thy bed. It's good to, to gather yourself, to gather your thoughts, get yourself together, get out of your emotions before you actually go and reprove someone for something that they may have done to you. Because if you go to them in your emotions, you're going to be reactive. You're not going to just be going to convey. You're going to be, you're going to, you, you're going to want to win them over. Or you're going to want them to understand how you feel or to validate how you feel. And if you go into the conversation with that mindset, you're going to be triggered or you can be triggered. But if you go into with the mindset that, hey, I'm just conveying how I felt, not how I feel. I'm conveying how I felt when that happened. I'm not going to be in my emotions and I'm not going to be looking for you to validate what I felt or what my experience was. I'm just going to convey to you what my experience was for understanding. And if I gain you by conveying my experience for you to not cross that boundary or to transgress against me again, then I've gained you. And if you don't receive what I'm saying, I'm not going to get into a passion because I'm not in my feelings to get into a passion. You have to be in your feelings to get into a passion. So that's why it's good to sit upon thy bed so that you can actually gain yourself and actually sort through things before you actually go to address it with someone. Got anything on that, Casa? Yes, sir. That, that precept here in Barnabas, it explains the process we go through when doing what Psalms 4 and 4 said. Standing mm. uh, and sitting down on your bed and then having what God said. So that was great to see the process of walking it out. Like Psalms 4 and 4 said, standing on sin, not okay. I've been transgressed against. I got to stand in awe. I notice I'm frustrated. Let me not sin. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. I need to go sit down somewhere and process what just happened. Then Barnabas explains, thou shalt be meek. Thou shalt be quiet. Thou shalt be fearing the words which thou hast heard. I got to remember the commands of Allah. I am and humble myself. Mm -hmm. I got to quiet my spirit and settle down. And then Gad said, forgive one another from the heart and hold not guile in your souls. So I have to let it go completely in loving word, deed, and inclination of soul before I go speak. And Barnabas finished it up. Thou shalt not bear a grudge against thy brother. Like, make sure there's no grudge. You got to keep the law. And the Ephesians don't let the sun go down upon my wrath to give place to the devil. Get out of my feelings to be able to go talk. So that's great understanding of interactions and handling offenses or problem solving or conflict resolution within any relationship, whether business, servant to master, child to parent, parent to child, spouse to spouse, brother to sister, and so on and so forth. It's amazing the spirit we walk in. The laws really guide us on what to do in every scenario. Yes, Anything. it does. All right. Now, after touching on that, let's see what can happen if we didn't take the time to do what the commandments say to get to meekness and that quietness of spirit being tranquil and letting go of what happened. 
Can you read Sirach 33 and 29, please? But be not excessive toward any. This means don't be abusive. This is what can happen if we stayed in our feelings. Even though we got to hold a servant accountable or a person accountable and not support or enable bad behavior, it's not righteous to get abusive because they aren't doing right at the moment or by overbearing them with work without loving them as yourself. Okay. Can you continue in that verse, please? And without discretion, do nothing. This is helpful to understand not to do anything in our feelings or frustration to operate outside of the fruits of the spirit. That verse then brings us right back to what we just talked about in Barnabas 19. <laughs> Stop. Hold on. Uh, this bothers me. I don't know what to do. I'm going to go sit down and walk through the process, fear in the war that I have heard of the commandments. I'm going to go through the process and find out what's right to do. It's really uh, putting things in Allah Hayim's hands to sit back and not respond, even though you see wrong being done to wait. Knowing Allah Hayim controls all, I can't move without having his direction. Okay. It said, let all things be done unto the edifying of our neighbor if i when i speak to my neighbor and my feelings i'm not edifying them neither am i using discretion true true because charity edifieth and charity suffers long charity doesn't get in feelings so we know we got standards to uphold Anything else there? No, already. Okay. The definition of discretion. The quality of behaving or speaking in such a way as to avoid causing offense or revealing private information. So if something happens or that person you have some relations with does, it, does something and you don't know what to do or how to behave, or speak in a way that avoids causing offense to Allah Hayyam by not staying in the fruits or within the boundaries of the law or what his wisdom is in how to handle the matter, do nothing to avoid transgression by acting without understanding or counsel. Don't go to speak about the person to others in your feelings to reveal their private info or what they struggle with as well. Gotta wait. Get counsel because it's instructed to do so. Sirach 37 and 16, please. Let reason go before every enterprise and counsel before every action. Follow the scriptures guide us on where to get counsel too. Sirach 6 and 6, please. Be in peace with many. Nevertheless, have but one counselor of a thousand. That one man needs to be a holy man who you have confirmed is doing right towards Allah Hayyam and sincerely cares about the outcome of your situation. Sirach 37 and 12, please. But be continually with the holy man whom thou knowest to keep the commandments of the Lord, whose mind is according to thy mind and with sorrow with thee if thou shalt miscarry. When getting counsel, do not forget the key thing to do first and foremost. Sirach 37 and 15, please. And above all this, pray to the Most High, that he would direct thy way in truth. So when something comes up and you don't know what to do, first do nothing. Go pray to Allah Hayyam to direct your way. And then get counsel from that one holy counselor so you can understand how to operate in the discretion of Allah Hayyam regarding the situation. You may have even got into your feelings about the thing the struggling person may have done. But the law says, be angry and sin not. And we see we have to be meek and quiet. And we have to love one another inclination of soul and deed and word, forgiven from the heart. So go sit down on your bed 
and commune with your own heart, pray into Allah and get out of your feelings to be at peace with what's happened, knowing nothing is done without Allah and forgive the wrong that has been done unto you so that you may be forgiven. So we can keep the rule of the faith that requires us not to let the sun go down on our wrath, lest the devil find place in us. Then reach out to our counselor or reach out to the counselor if you're having trouble getting over the thing, if you need to, and get understanding so we can know how to operate with discretion, not offend Allah in the matter. Hopefully this helps understand how to walk wisely when interacting with a struggling child, struggling servant, or struggling spouse, or struggling friend, or fellow person, to help them come out of their struggles and not transgressing against Allah yourself. Sirach 30 and 30, if you don't have anything, please. If thou have a servant, let him be unto thee as thyself, because thou hast bought him with the price. Remember the law to love thy neighbor as thyself? So don't do unto him or unto that person what you wouldn't have done unto you. And don't have them do what you wouldn't do yourself. Sirach 33 and 31. If thou have a servant, entreat him as a brother, for thou hast need of him as of thy own soul. There we see the love for another as ourself. Remember, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of our relations, personal or business. So we have need of them as our own soul, right? We're a brotherhood in this. We all need one another. So treating a person as an equal, like a brother or sister, though that person may be a servant or may be a child or may be a spouse, Respecting them as fellow creation of Allah Hayyam under our same Lord Christ Yache is essential. This goes for our kids too, treating them with respect as people, not our underlings, or lifting ourselves up against them because they too are our brothers and sisters in Christ truly. No, we have need of servants and children and spouses like our own soul. Because in treating them evil will cause them to leave us mentally or physically. Continue, please. If there isn't something you have there. If thou entreat him evil, he will run from thee. Which way would thou go to seek him? You see the result of being excessive to abuse a person, whether it's your spouse, your child, or a servant, or some or a friend. They will run from you eventually, either in their mind just not paying you any mind or literally will leave and not have anything to do with you. Many parents have been forsaken of their kids because of the traumas of their upbringing where the kids have nothing to do with them as adults. So many times when they get old, they forsake them in an old folks home and such. But the parents don't realize this partly has to do with the results of the evil treatment they received as kids, seeing their upbringing as normal, not seeing the trauma from the experiences of their youth in themselves. This is why humility plays such an important role, because when the children try to speak to the parents, they're oftentimes dismissed and not heard from the parent when addressing the issues for the parent to consider. As servants, or for any person in most scenarios, they will leave a bad master when they get fed up and find an opportunity to. And once a person leaves you in their mind or literally, what will you do to get them back? Only Allah Hayyam can restore things in truth. Because if you continue taking matters into your own hands to try to get them back instead of submitting to the law and the fruits of Allah Hayyam to just do what's right to him, waiting on his mercy to restore things, and turn your servant or child or spouse's heart to return, you'll only make things worse as the Levite in Judges who ran behind his wife who left him and it turned out worse for both of them. On the other hand, the father in Luke 15 who let his son go putting things in Allah's hands 
and Elohim brought his son to repentance to return and serve his father from the heart. We're going to look at this for understanding that difference of, okay, a person may have messed up and pushed that loved one away. Or that person just may have despised the nurture and left themselves. In either case, when that separation comes, we're looking at these testimonies to see how when you go by what Allah Hayim says to do, Allah Hayim gets the glory and will bring things back together if it be his will. But if you go according to your own will, you're just going to make matters worse because you didn't go according to what Allah Hayim said to do. Let's jump into this here. For examples, this Levite, he had a maid wife who played the whore and fell into spiritual fornication to leave her husband and return to her father's house for four months where her father, unfortunately, was her enabler. So he didn't teach her to return to her husband and be a keeper at home, loving her husband, but rather he kept her there with him, though she played the whore and was wrong for what she did. Now the Levite, we will see he didn't wait on Allah Hayim to bring her to repentance, but took matters in his own hands to try to run after her and get her back by winning her over with words. But he didn't understand he wasn't helping her change by coming to save her from her experiences she needed to go through to learn humility mm -hmm. and respect for him as her husband and accountability for herself. Let's jump into the story to see how things can go when we don't wait on Allah Hayim or seek his counsel. Can you read Judges 19, verse 2 and 3, please? And his maid wife played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there for a whole months. And her husband arose and went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. So his plan was to go after her and win her over, though she did the wrong, so he wasn't holding her accountable. All right, continue, please. And she brought him into her father's house. She got what she wanted, as she didn't have to take any accountability for being wrong or change. Continue, please. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. The father rejoiced because he was glad to have him come there since he didn't encourage or want his daughter to leave in the first place. Hence, when you read the story, the father kept trying to get the Levite to stay because he didn't want his daughter to go. Having his own attachment to her, that was more important than what's right to Allah Hayim, that she ought to cleave to her husband. Continue in verse 4, please. We jump in further into the story. And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him. And he abode with him three days. And they did eat and drink and lodge there. All right. After a few days, the Levite finally decided to leave with his wife. Notice, he's doing things without counsel from Allah Hayim, okay? Jump to verse 10, please. But the man would not tarry that night, but he rose up and departed, and came over against Jebus, which is Jerusalem. And there were with him two asses saddled, his maid wife also was with him. And when they were by Jebus, the day was far spent, and the servant said unto his master, Come, I pray thee, and let us turn into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. And his master said unto him, We will not turn aside hither into the city of a stranger that is not of the children of Israel. We will pass over to Gibeah. Notice here, decisions being made without inquiring of Allah for counsel. Continue, please. In 15. And they turned aside thither to go in and to lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he set him down in a street of the city, for there was no man that took them into his house to lodging. 
See the warning signs Alahayim gave that this environment wasn't good? Eventually, a man who wasn't a Benjamite came and helped him. But this is where things may seem good, but it's unfortunately some bad to come because we didn't wait on Alahayim in the first place. Continue, please. And behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at even, which was also of Mount Ephraim. And he sojourned in Gibeah, but the men of the place were Benjamites. All right, jump to verse 20, please. And the old man said, Peace be with thee. Howsoever let all thy wants lie upon me, only lodge not in the streets. So he brought him into his house and gave provender unto the asses, and they washed their feet and did eat and drink. Now as they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain sons of Belial, beset the house round about, and beat at the door, and spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring forth the man that came into thy house, that we may know him. Hopefully we understand this here. Allahim, though we do things without his counsel, he still has mercy to warn us, but sometimes we're not paying attention to the signs. Like nobody being there to help the man would have let him know that wasn't a place to be if he was paying attention. But here we are now, the things have gotten where they're going. We see the merriment turns to trouble after not having taken counsel from Alahayim to restore things from the get-go. Unfortunately, the Levite got beat almost to death and his wife was killed. Can you continue chapter 20, verse 4 and 5, please? And the Levite, the husband of the woman that was slain, answered and said, I came into Gibeah, that belongeth to Benjamin, I and my maid wife to lodge. And the men of Gibeah rose against me, and beset the house round about upon me by night, and thought to have slain me. And my maid wife have they forced that she is dead. Unfortunately, that man went and did what he thought would work to bring the relationship back together without inquiring of Alahayim or getting counsel as he made his own decision of what he was going to do. And unfortunately, we see where his plan eventually led to his and his wife's hurt in the end. Now, let's see on the other side of a person waiting on Allah Hayim to bring things together in patience. We're jumping into this story of Luke 15. The father had two sons and the younger son asked for his portion of inheritance and went and spent it all up in another land. Then a famine came in that land, and he was impoverished, serving someone in hunger. So Alahayim took him through what he needed to, to see what he desired wasn't good for him. Then he came to repentance for leaving his father, and how he operated. Let's jump into that story to see how that went. Luke 15, verse 17, through... Basically 24, please. And when he had came to himself. So he could finally see himself truly after everything went downhill for him. After he sought after what he wanted and it failed. Just as we learned earlier, Alahayim lets us go through things to see things for ourselves. Continue, please. He said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. So he was willing to confess his fault and humbly do whatever he needed to to restore the relationship. See how things go when Allah is involved. Continue, please. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. You remember we read in the How to Help a Servant Struggling that and treat him as a brother 
as one that we have need of ourselves or as our own soul, mm -hmm. you can see the separation. The father didn't stop loving him. He just loved them enough to wait on Allah Hayyam, truly. He didn't hate him to take matters in his own hands. He didn't hate Allah Hayyam to take matters in his own hands even. His father waited on Allah Hayyam and didn't go running behind his son to stop him from going through his experiences and didn't hold a grudge or bitterness against him by evidence of his compassion when he saw him. Continue, please. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. See how Allah can bring a man back to life in Christ and restore a family when we do things according to his will. Also, we hope that helps for understanding through the testimonies, like waiting on a Hayyam, doing nothing without discretion, and staying out of our feelings, knowing that everything is from Allah Hayyam, it can really help us to see things come together in whatever relationships may have been broken or are not um, mended at this time. Okay. Anything on that, Zakwa? No, I'm good. Okay. Now also, when interacting with someone who struggles with evil, whether spouse, child, parent, servant, if you're interacting with someone that's struggling with evil works, you have to be diligent to pay attention and keep record of things to be sure you aren't being done wrong and you aren't being manipulated or gaslighted because you have to have an account of things to know the truth. Can you read Sirach 42, verse 6 and 7, please? Sure keeping is good where an evil wife is, and shut up where many hands are. Okay. Deliver all things in number and weight, and put all in writing that thou givest out or receivest in. So you got to keep record to be sure you know the truth so that you can't be manipulated or gaslighted and are able to remember the truth of matters and conversations and also keep track of your things. Okay. Can you read Sirach 42 verse 1 and 2, please? Of these things, be not thou ashamed, and accept no person to sin thereby, of the law of the Most High and his covenant. So, everything we discussed today, don't be ashamed to do it, and don't accept any persons to sin and not do it. We got to hold the law of the Most High and his covenant. Don't be ashamed to do what the law says and to hold those within your household to abide and be accountable of the same as it will save us. Proverbs 22 and 6, please. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In humility, we will see that we're children to Allah Hayyam, as he trains us up, and may use us in areas where we're stronger to help others. And by us using every experience to learn from, we get stronger in areas just as our children of the flesh, that we may not depart from it after we've overcome it, growing more seasoned in the faith. Ooh. Anything else, Zachary? I think we're good. I'm going to open up for questions. <laughs> the people that, that made it through the whole thing. <laughs> 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 oh, it's a long lesson. No, they were... Why?
All right, y'all guys got any questions? Y'all still awake? Go, Michael. No questions. All right. You want to close it up, we Michael? We made it, Casa. Huh? Man, we made it. Let's close it out, man. I think you're all for learning with us today. Please make sure you go and visit the website at www.hebrewreaders.com. If you have any questions or concerns or comments, or you just want to reach out to us, please send an email to hebrewreaders at gmail.com. You can always write in the chats. Um, please make sure you check out our other lessons, uh, especially the lessons that were before this one, um, as far as our law class lessons and the lessons on building a family. And there's so many other, so many other lessons. If you're new, thank you for watching the lesson today. If Alaheim led you to come and partake in the, in the understanding with us, um, if you, if you have any questions, please, please reach out so that we can give you the understanding to help you in your journey. You got anything, brother Kasifa? Oh no, man! Praise Allahim. You said everything that was needed to be said, and. Thank you. Keep us in your prayers. I think that's it. <laughs> Amen. And you, you guys are definitely being ours. So we love you guys. And Allah keep you all. Shalom. Shalom. HRC, 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 HRC,